Coming to you from the Troy Lee Design Saloon in Corona, California, it's the Whiskey Throttle Show, bringing you the legends and leaders of our sport with your host, David Pingree. This week's guest is brought to you by Yamaha, the leaders in the power sports industry, motocross bikes, street bikes, adventure bikes, generators, side-by-sides, quads, boats. Yamaha sets the standard. Yamaha revs your heart. Today's guest is presented by Therabody, the world leader in human performance, wellness, and recovery. The pioneers of percussive therapy, Therabody changed the game with the Theragun device. Their arsenal has grown to include recovery compression systems, power dot electric muscle stimulators, adjustable vibrating foam rollers, and a complete line of organic wellness solutions with their Thera One lineup. Whether you are a world-class athlete or you are just looking to improve your overall health, Therabody has the tools to help. Today's show brought to you in part by Method Race Wheels, the strongest, lightest, fastest wheels in off-road. Method dominates the off-road market and they have the wheels for your truck, sprinter, SUV, Jeep, or van. SKDA Graphics. SKDA has turned the motorcycle graphic design world on its head by bringing a fast, fresh look into the sport. From outside the box designs to retro looks to a complete line of whiskey throttle show graphics, SKDA is operating on a completely different plane than the rest. With free global shipping on orders of over $100 and unrivaled customer service, right now is the time to freshen up the look of your ride. Troy Lee Designs. Built for the world's fastest racers, Troy Lee Designs blends elite level protection with a history of industry leading style and performance. From motocross gear to custom paint to bicycle protection, Troy Lee Designs is waiting for you on the next level. Thanks for joining us here at the Whiskey Throttle Show. I'm David Pinger, your host, and today a really cool guest, Mike Alessi, here from Florida. I've been trying to connect with you for a bit, and it worked out. You're out here for the Two Stroke Nationals. Stoked to have you on. Thanks for coming. Thank you, David. I appreciate it. You know, it's uh, it's been a long time since we kind of like just sat down and talked, and uh, this is pretty interesting to be able to just be in California, yeah. getting ready for Two Stroke National here next weekend, and uh, try to put on the show for some fans that are going to be in the Southern California area. Absolutely. Well, and something that I really like about this show is I get to sit down with guys who, you know, you and I have chatted a hundred times over the years, but not, we don't get to sit down for hours and just talk. Yes, and so sir. I, it's really a fun, fun for me to kind of get to know guys better. So uh, we start every show with our Method Race Wheels front end chatter. They bring you the lightest, strongest, fastest wheels in off road. So if you guys are looking for wheels for your truck, van, sprinter, your side by side, go check out Method, Method Race Wheels. You get 20% off using our code Whiskey Throttle. Uh, to save you a lot of money. So go check them out. They're um, awesome and look awesome. Uh, so a couple of questions just to get this started here. Uh, you're here for the Two Stroke Nationals. You cleaned up last year. Two years ago. Oh, it was two years ago. I, yeah, okay. I, broke, I broke my wrist last year, um, uh, March 1st. So Was that when you hit the back of that guy when he, he was stopped? No, no, no. That, that was that, something different. That was vet championships in November. That's right. Okay. Okay. So two years ago you cleaned up. Yes, and you sir. made like 30 grand that weekend. Yes, sir. Well, it was actually more like 40 after the extra bonuses. But Jeez. yeah, just from Eddie Sanders, that, that weekend was 30 for sure. Yeah, it was good money. And ever since that race, you know, nobody could get a hold of him <laughs> since then. And he's kind of disappeared off the map. So yeah, it's been kind of interesting. Eddie, um, we hope you're okay. <laughs> <laughs> that was like his one big bang. And then he was like, see ya. But there's still good purse money. I was looking through the pro purse. If you did, uh, it's Open Pro, 125 Pro, the Pasha thing, and then um yeah that's it that's the only three i thought there was what's the third one there's a plus 30. 250 open and 125 right yeah uh, 125 pro 250 pro and then the plus 30 and if you want them all it's pretty good money yeah well you have to have the endurance to go do four 20 minute motos plus the five six lap race for the pasha race mm. so you and it's supposed to be warm in the 80s so yeah, you gotta it's... you gotta have the not just the speed but you have the, the endurance yeah. to be able to go do that much racing at that kind of intensity and speed you got it. Well, I'm 34 years old, and we'll see what happens. I'm, I'm definitely riding the 250 Open and the Plus 30. Okay. So I got my hard class and then, you know, somewhat easy class. Yeah. Well, cool. Um, so you, you kind of keep popping out of retirement ever since you quit racing I'm Supercross not, and Motocross. I'm not, not I'm 100% not retired. Okay. At all. I, I, I have no intentions of being retired. Okay, that's at good. At all. That, I mean, for me, I'm still looking at trying to do World Supercross in the fall. Okay. 
And right now I'm talking with Mike Genova with Moto Concepts to try to be on, on their team. If that doesn't work out, I'm working with uh, Dustin Pipes at HEP to ride on their team ah. to, to, to race over uh, the World Supercross, which, which starts the beginning to middle of September, September 10th or 11th, something like that. So, um, yeah, definitely not for sure retired. I have no intention of being retired. I want to race, and I still feel fit enough that – if there was a the call to be a fill-in or pop-in, I could race Supercross right now, ready to go. Are you going to Canada this summer? No, I'm done okay. with Canada. Okay. Yeah, I did my time up there. It was good. I had enjoyable times. Um, unfortunately, like, just being honest, like, the Canadians up there, they hire Canadians. They yeah. they don't want to hire Americans anymore. And it was pretty evident after I got second to what would be called the GOAT of Canadian motocross, which is Colton Falciati. And I brought the championship down to the last moto in 19. And I went to every single team. I'm like, hey, I got second in the championship. My teammates retiring. That makes me the number one guy for next year. Do you have a spot? Every single team, same thing is we're already full. We already got our guys. And I'm just like, okay, you know what? I got you. you right, it, yeah. They're telling me without telling me that because I'm not Canadian, I'm yeah. not getting the chance. I'm not getting the shot. So at that point, I was like, you know, I'm done racing up here. I'm over it. And I'm pretty, pretty much never coming back. That happened in Japan, too. You know, they used to bring American riders over forever. And I think the manufacturers all kind of went, all right, hey, we're spending all this money bringing American guys over, trying to compete with each other. Let's just keep it. Yeah, sir. Only, it, so. it becomes a point where, you know, they're, they're sucking all the money out of it and they're not giving it to their country people. Yeah. And, and that's what they want, whether it be Canada, Japan, even yeah. in America. That's what I mean. That's what that's that's what racing is about is giving all the money to the, the top guy. And if he's American it, or, you know, Canadian or Japan, whatever country, it's just it's how it goes. Yeah. I think in those smaller countries where racing is not as big, it's even more pronounced, you know, because here. If you're if you can win a title, they'll hire you no matter where you're from, right? Yes, sir. A little different. Um, so I did want to ask you about this World Supercross thing because I, when I started thinking about it, well, who would who would maybe go into this? You were one of the first names that popped into my head. Yes, sir. It's it's, I, it's, is, it's so it's is, not hard. It, it, there's no basically the whoops are amateur whoops. The lap times are 45 minutes, uh, 45 seconds. So it's it's a basic track, super simple. I'm a good starter. Short motos. I mean, it just fits my yeah. like who I am. And, and is, is Genova, Genova, are they planning on going? Is that? As of right now, for sure, yes, they okay. are going. And in, in, in the rules, you have to have four riders, two in the 250, two in the 450. Oh. So for me, I'm eligible to be in the 250 or the 450. And with my weight being 155, I can ride either motorcycle. That's right. Huh. Interesting. You, you still like riding a 250F? I rode it today. Yeah. That's what I rode. Okay. Huh. Yeah, I was getting ready for, uh, I'm not going to name the track and give them publicity, but um, I was at a certain track here in Southern California, and yeah, there was good riders there, and getting ready for my, my regional for Loretta Lynn's and, uh, in June, which is coming up in a couple months, so, you know, try to figure out the track, and it's funny because I haven't, I hadn't ridden that certain track since the national back in 2011, so mm. it was my first time back riding that track in over a decade, and it was like, it was a little weird, so... Uh, I'm not saying I was slow, but I wasn't definitely going yeah. like my fastest. So, so who else would they be looking at? Uh, Brayton, like Brayton was another well, yeah. guy. I thought, oh, he'd be perfect to jump in and do that. Yeah, well, he's the kind of the leader of running everything over there. So, it, it, for me, I'm just trying to figure out the position, the slot that I can fit in, whether it be with Moto Concepts or be with HEP Suzuki or even maybe another team, because there there's certain amount of teams that they're going to have, mm -hmm. and they're going to have 20 riders for each each class main event. And, uh, and and from what I've been told, if one of the four riders doesn't show up, like let's just say they miss their flight, they get sick, you know, they stub their toe or whatever, you being a baby and they can't show up, the team gets fined $100,000 for not showing up for one rider. So the, do they need to have kind of reserves? Correct. Okay. So as of right now, that's what I'm kind of talking with my dad, Tony Alessi, and Mike Genova is like, I can be that kind of that guy in the wings just in case, you know, something happens, someone gets hurt. And you need a guy to like right now to fill in. I can do it. I'm available. It's in the fall time. So, you know, in Florida, you can, I mean, it's beautiful weather in September, October. Yeah. So for me, I'm basically turnkey. Yeah. It's just finding, if for me, it's just finding the right slot, the right position, and still be able to make some money to support my family while doing the racing. Sure. Awesome, man. Well, um, I'm excited to see what, what, what goes on with that. I know there's some, certainly some people here concerned that, it's going to get rid of the nationals potentially because this year it is a short 
series at the end of the summer. But next year, it's going to go all summer into the fall. So you won't be able to do nationals and that World Supercross round. It's going to be, what do you want to do? World yeah. Supercross series or are you doing nationals? So it'll be interesting to see what the teams do. Yes, sir. Um, awesome. Well, uh, Arena Cross, that was the other thing I wanted to ask you about. You've been jumping back into some of those. How's that been going? Yeah, so originally, because um, I was having a baby the beginning to middle of February, so I kind of talk to each of the promoters on my, like, Hey, I'll do two of the kicker, two of the Hoosier, and then one of the tri-state. And the first one I won, which was in council bluffs, Iowa. And then coming from Florida was 85, 90 degrees on Christmas. We were swimming. And then the very next weekend's the race in council bluffs. It was negative 21. <laughs> I won the first night, which was really good. And I was so sick the second night. So I, I was getting sick during the first night of racing because of the the conditions were just so brutal, even inside in the track was minus five. Oh my god! So when I came off from the the track on my podium, lungs after, all burning. Well, I'm talking, and literally you can see the smoke coming out of my the frost coming out of my my mouth as I'm doing my interview. I'm I'm just frozen. Wow. It took me literally like five minutes to take the freaking helmet chin strap off because my fingers were numb <laughs> coming off the track. That's crazy. So um yeah, I won the first night, then I got sick, and the second night I was I. I, I think I pulled I pulled off. I didn't even finish the second right. night. I was so sick. Then I went to Denver for the first uh, kicker round, and I got uh, altitude sickness. So that was bad. Then I flew home just to, like, recover, be good for the next round, went to Texas, second lap of the heat race, had a weird, like, it was like a 3-5-3, three, three, and as I clipped the 5 to, to compress the suspension to bounce, I think I just missed the top with the, the front wheel, and it didn't get the bounce, and it went like that. Kicked you over. And it just straight endo, and uh, it landed right on my shoulder, elbow, and I had a bad hematoma. So that took a good three weeks to get back from. And it was kind of like a blessing in disguise because my daughter ended up coming uh, the end of January when she was originally supposed to be around uh, Valentine's weekend. Oh. So she came two weeks early. So it was just it was just weird how when I crashed in the moment I was laying there on the ground, I remember the thought saying to myself, I'm effing done. I'm done. I, I, I get what you're saying. You're telling me without telling me. I'm giving you an injury. I'm giving you a small crash, enough to where you're banged up, but you, you're not 100% like broken, but enough to where you got to go home and take a couple weeks off. And, dude, I, I never, I, I swear, laying on the ground, I've never been more of a believer in God saying, you know what? I'm listening to what you're telling me right now. Wow. And literally that night, I made the, I, I was like, I'm done going home. And we drove all the way from Texas back home. And sure enough, you know, n no more than like a week, week and a half later, we had we had our daughter, and uh, I'm you know getting choked up. It's just uh, everything happens for a reason in life, yeah. and that's God's plan. Whether it's good or bad, we are all living the destiny and the and the life that God has already planned for us before our birth. And at the end of the day, we're just living it. Yeah. And for me, you know, me and my wife, we've been together for 19 years, married 11 years. And, uh, you know, we decided to wait to have kids until we were pretty much close to being done racing. And, uh, you know, there was a point, you know, and I think it was like 17 when I, when I did my collarbone at St. Louis, uh, press day supercross. And, you know, I was going, kind of just going through the motions and, and I was kind of just burnt out with supercross doing it for so long, been racing professional since 04. And I kind of just. And that's why I kind of stepped away from Supercross for the last couple of years. It's just, it, it burned me out. Mm -hmm. All the travel. and You've all, been going forever. That is, 10 years is normally a pretty average window. Yes, you've, sir. You've blown way, way past yes, that. Yes, sir. So. And I still have fun doing it. And what's crazy is I actually love the training. I love the mm -hmm. road biking. I love the, the gym work. I love the yoga. I just, and I... A lot of people don't like it, but I I love doing ice baths. Like those are oh, awesome. I you're love, crazy. I love doing the the the, the ice bath and the, the the sauna back and forth. It's such good recovery. I have one of Rhino's saunas. You know the one man. And yeah. I'll, it is the most painful, miserable three minutes of my life to get into that <laughs> ice after. I hate it. It hurts. I can't breathe. I just am counting every second. Every I get and then out. an hour later, you're just like, oh wow. I actually. It feel does really feel good. good. No, I, I, you do feel good. It's just. He keeps saying, telling me, you'll get used to it. It'll get easier. It hasn't gotten any easier. Yeah. I hate it. But as far as like, you know, like I was kind of alluding to about just being burnt out. Now that I've had, had, we've had our kids, my wife and I, and now we're like really settled down and we have our house. We have everything in order. We're, we're happy. Mm -hmm. Like, super, like I mean, you know, people exaggerate that they're super happy and, you know, maybe they're not. 
we actually are happy. Yeah. Like we've accomplished what we wanted to accomplish in racing and making a career out of it. You know, I've, I have my rental houses. I have money saved in the bank and we're good. Yeah. Like for me, I just love racing and I just want to just still do it. Do you still like when you're on the line or, or, uh, you know, you're going to the gate, the nerves don't get to you where you're like, gosh, no. what am I doing? I hate no. this. You still enjoy that competing at that level. People ask me all the time, man, why are you still doing this? Why are you still racing? Like, why you put your body through this torture? And my response is pretty much always the same. There's, there's the, the, from the start to the first turn, there's something that you just cannot replicate. The feeling of that gate dropping and the adrenaline rush that I get and just coming into the first turn, battling and just rubbing elbows, bumping, like I'm the baddest mother effer, like yeah, right. And for, even if it's for 10 seconds, dude, for me, the high I get from that, dude, it's I'll straight up say it's better than sex. <laughs> honestly, it just, it just, it just yeah. makes me feel like I'm the man. Yeah. And then once we get to the first turn, like I'll race like hard. And if someone's faster than me, they're going to get by regardless. At the end of the day though, I'm, I, you know, I'm not going to do anything stupid to get hurt or take somebody out. Like I got a wife and kids, like I got a house. Yeah. Like I don't need to do that kind of stupid stuff anymore. But you still enjoy it, huh? But for me, that's why I do it from the start to the first turn. That emotional rush and adrenaline, oh my God, it's just like, it's something you can't, you cannot, you can't yeah. manufacture it. It's not fake. It's real. Yeah. Yeah. And I think only motocross guys get that. But, you know, whether you're even a local guy, the sound of all those bikes and the vibration and the, you know, it's just you know what could go wrong. You know what a, how good a whole shot feels. It is a lot of uh, stimulus coming at you. A lot of guys don't like going in the first turn hard and fast because they kind of, as I kind of say, they nut up or, you know, they, yeah, they, they, they clam up or whatever. Like for me, I just, I like to just send it into the first <laughs> turn. Like that's just me. Well, that's why you're part of why you're a good starter. <laughs> I'm pretty good at them. <laughs> yeah. All right. Hey, that was our, uh, method race wheels front end chatter. Go over to whiskey throttle show.com. We've got a ton of new stuff, uh, in our merchandise line. One of my favorite teas we've ever put out. It's a fight club sort of uh, ripoff. Very, very fun. Uh, and also, it's coming up on Father's Day. Get your Motul wash bucket. So we still got some of those available. Comes with a full complement of, you know, brushes and Motul products to wash your bike with a bucket. Uh, all kinds of awesome stuff. So get over there and check that out. Uh, we appreciate it. And let's get to your story. Mike's brought to you today by Therabody. If you guys are looking for, uh, whether it's a power dot, rollers, uh, compression pants, suit, every, whatever you want. They've got everything over there uh, to keep you healthy and fit, recover from injuries, prevent injuries. Uh, so check those guys out, therabody.com. Uh, so start, let's start with taking me to where you grew up. Was it Apple Valley always up here in the no, high no, desert? No, we were born and raised right here in Simi Valley where Cole Seeley was from. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. So, well, it's kind of, I kind of get into the story, so it's kind of funny. We lived in apartments. My mom and dad weren't rich, just like Jeff Seeley and Karen Seeley were not rich. We lived in the same housing complex. Did you know them? Well, I'm getting to oh, it. I'm sorry. getting to it. It's all good. So we lived in the second story of the apartment complex, and they lived in the bottom story just around the corner from where we lived. In the same same you know unit, you would call it, yeah. but, but just a different section. And so my dad taught Jeff and I how to ride a motorcycle in the tennis court. So, cause it has the fencing with the, you know, the, okay. mo the moving fencing. So, yeah. you know, if you got wide open or whiskey, right? Whiskey, yeah. whiskey throttle, you just kind of hit the fence, you know, and it like <laughs> absorbs it. Right. Yeah. And it's a slow crash. Well, Jeff saw that going on and was like, Hey, you think you can give Cole and uh chance his brother, you know, you teach him how to ride a bike. And dude, I'm telling you, if, if my dad never taught him how to ride a bike, I mean, it, you're kidding. So like he taught them how, huh? Cole, you know, maybe, I mean, he's such a good BMXer that he may have never been a dirt biker. Yeah. And so that's kind of how the whole racing started or riding started. And then it just transferred into amateur racing. And so then how old were you really? I remember you being on P. Three. So you must have started. Yeah. Three years old. Three. And then I was three, four years old. And then I was racing at five. Jeez. Did you play any other sports during that no. time? Really? Nothing. No. I did BMX and I was pretty good at it. But the love of dirt bikes is just... Right away you were hooked, huh? Yeah, yes, sir. Did your dad race? He made it to, like, local A. Okay. B, like, and he said that was it. Okay. Huh. That's interesting. Um, So, <laughs> what was your first bike? Do you remember? PW50. Okay. Yeah. And then I, I won Loretta's in 1995, and we kept that motorcycle for so many years, and uh, my dad, like, had it like shadowed with lights on it and, and just, he was so proud of it. 
And one day Jeff <laughs> Jeff and I took it down and took it in the backyard and started motoing it. Oh no. And made like a little like peewee track. Oh, he was pissed. <laughs> oh, we just destroyed the thing. So how old were you when you guys moved up to the high desert? Okay, so that was when we got the Honda contract, which we were 11, 12 years old, something like that. Oh, okay. So you this were out there for a while still riding racing from Simi Valley. Yeah, yeah. We were born and raised Simi Valley, and we lived there till O two. Okay. And then and then we moved in O two up to the desert because— So where would you ride, like— we had Piru or I, what was close what, for you? Well, that was Piru, but we had a track that my dad and Jeff Seely built for us oh. with shovels. <laughs> and real, it, real good track, I yeah. Guess. And it was just in a field just behind the apartment complex, okay. And that's where we rode huh. for so many years. It doesn't take much when you're a little kid, huh? You could have an oval track and just have a ball, yeah, yeah. I had a real janky track when I was little, too, yeah. And a lot of people don't realize, but like Cole and I, like you know. We, you know, we come from nothing, yeah. you know, and our parents didn't have money and we just scraped, clawed and just mm. scrapped to get to where we are now. And Yeah. I So I, I've got that on here that I wanted to talk to you about because I remember my early re- memories of you guys are your dad seeing you at Paris and your dad was announcing, announcing. Yep. I want to say maybe did he write for Cycle he News wrote, too? He, he would write the race reports. So he would announce and write for Cycle News in trade for Jeff and I to ride for free. Yeah, he hustled, man. Like he still hustling. Yeah, yeah, you're right. I just remember thinking, gosh, this guy, he's doing it. Like he whatever whatever it takes to get his kids out there. That's cool. Yeah, he, I mean, even today, man. He, I mean, my dad's been crazy, and people you know have seen that with you know the racing and the shows back in the day with the inside the moto and he just he just wants the best for us at the end of the day he's a father just like you and i it's you want the best for your kids and you're just willing to do whatever it takes to give them the best opportunity to win and i think the way he goes across is just it was the wrong way in a lot of people's eyes in reality he you know he just was doing the best he could for his, his kids i think that your dad is super intense and very driven and when you add in that family component it maybe got a little bit too much, yes, right? Sir. Yeah. Because the minute you stopped, you know, you went your way and he started working like with Moto Concepts or whatever, I thought, man, he's a really good team manager. Like I would want him in my corner. Yeah. Because it's, he it's, will he will do whatever it takes, yeah. right? You know what I mean? And the fact that he wasn't those riders' parents, the emotion was taken out of it, but he was still all in. Mm-hmm. So I, I think that, you know... Whether it's... Uh, whether it's he Jeff- probably got a bad rap and... And it, some of it was maybe deserved at times, but it was just because, like you said, he he was passionate. He wanted the best for you guys. Yeah, maybe just too passionate. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's, the that's end, the way I looked at, at it. At the end of the day, whether it's you know the team riders or Jeff and I, he's going to do the best that's going to make the team better. And it's kind of weird to say, but he's like a human dyno. Like when he rides the motorcycle up and down the road or where even at the test track, he can diagnose like the gearing problem that's that's wrong or something in the engine that needs to be better. Oh, really? Yeah. And like just the other day at Varner's, like we're doing the engine stuff. He's right there watching the numbers. And then he's like, okay, well, let's let's do a splash of MRX02. And the, dude, another horsepower. Like he just knows his, his mm. SHIT. He just knows what yeah. he's doing. So you guys were at it hard from a very, very young age. Like, you know, uh, what do I got here? In 95, you went to Loretta's for the first time. Yep. Now, I, I, 94, and I got eighth. Oh, okay. Well, these then, are your wins. So yeah, your first win was 95. Correct. Yep. I was <laughs> in a four to six-year-old division. <laughs> yeah. So you I, were, I think I've won all the, like, 50s, 60s, 80s, super mini, and then 250 and, and open, I didn't yeah. I didn't do no B classes. I went straight from 85s to to 450. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's pretty impressive. Hey, you know you know you're old, right? When you're looking at that list and it says the four stroke open class. Yeah, yeah, I know. Well. <laughs> Come on, that's just like what? Everything is four strokes now. So do you when you look back at your memories, those early memories, 50s, 60s, even 80s, are yeah. they good memories? Oh yeah. Yeah, they were for sure, great. You know, I mean, because I feel like there was also a lot of pressure on you. Um, well, I had, I, I mean, there was pressure. It was just I was racing like in the beginning. It was Millsaps, and then and then JG, and then at the end it was Villapoto, and we're all uh, well. Grant's not, but uh, Millsaps is February '88. I'm May '88, and Villa was uh, August '88, and then it was Jeff Osborne. 
and jo- and Josh Hill that were 89. Okay. But it was like that was our group. Yeah, all same age. And- yes, sir. Hmm. And and I think JG he was 85 or 86, so he was quite a few years older. Hmm. Okay. Um, did you know? from a pretty young age that's what you wanted to do like were you when we got the honda contract it was kind of like that which was when that would have been on 80s oh two oh two okay so as of right now uh yeah in oh two that's when we kind of realized this is for real like and that's why we moved everything from simi to up in the desert and we just committed to trying to to make it Mm. and um you know luckily honda gave us that opportunity and and you know just looking at you know, the, the results, they speak for themselves from 2001 all the way till 2004. I never lost a moto. So me and Wyndham as of right now have the longest winning streak of 19 motos in a row at Loretta's. Is that right? It's uh, a tie. It's a tie. Do you still have the most titles or me, Santorillo and Stewart have 11. Yeah. So I go there this year to win the plus 25. Ah. I'll break that tie and be the winningest rider. That's cool. Try. <laughs> have you been back there? Did you do the national they had there? Like, no, have no, you no, been no, back no. since 04? I, I went there just to watch. Did, not, it, not did right. it look small? Uh, yeah, it looks yeah. tight. Yeah. The way I, I, I was shooting, last time I was there was uh, 1992. <laughs> so I was barely three years old. Yeah, that was the last time I raced there, and I have never been back. But when I watch it on TV, I'm like, I remember that being like bigger. bigger. You know, in my head, it was like this big national track. And, and now it's, not. It's, it's this tiny little. I think that's just the evolution of the four strokes and the way that people ride and just you well, know. you just grow up to you, you know. Yeah. Anyway, I thought that was that was funny. Um, so you kind of mentioned all those fast kids you were racing with at the time and grew up racing with. Who? who what riders did you look up to as a kid? Bucklew, hundred percent. Really, Justin Bucklew. Justin Bucklew was my favorite amateur rider. Looking up, he was smooth. Very that smooth. Style he was, was calculated, yeah. and um, yeah, his his mom and dad were great people and would you know, help me out and take me riding and. Or as Art Ekman that, would say, Jason Buckaloo. Is that what he said? <laughs> yeah. I was David Pingram. So, you know, that was just Yeah, <laughs> Buckaloo was, was my idol growing up for sure. Huh. That's, that's interesting. See, that's why I like to ask that question because it's different for different people, you know. Not, not everybody's Jeremy. Well, I mean, pro would, like real pro would be like David Bailey. Yeah. I oh, love. so you were watching old stuff. Old stuff. Yeah. yeah him and Ricky Johnson back mm-hmm. in the. 86, 80, 85, 86 Anaheim races, dude, yeah. just going at it. So good, huh? You've had a chance to meet those guys now, obviously, all of those guys. Did did you, you know, they always say never meet your heroes because they'll, they'll let you down. Did you, <laughs> how was the experience of meeting them? I mean, I'm not one of those people who gets, like, starstruck. I'm, I, I try to treat everybody the same as I would want to be treated myself, so... I just try to talk to him with, you yeah. know, professionalism and be, you know, hey, how you doing? How you been? How's yeah. life? How's your family? That's pretty much it. Yeah. But they were, everybody's cool with you, right? Like, there hasn't been in racing to me, anyone that I've met, you know, because Wardy was my guy when I was a kid. I, he was, there was nobody cooler. <laughs> and um, when I finally met Jeff and, you know, we've gotten to be friends and it's like, he's awesome. You know, like it didn't let me down. You know what I mean? We're, I, I had him on this pedestal, and he didn't let me down at all. You Good. know what I'm saying? So, anyway. You did a, a KTM Supercross, uh, Junior Supercross Challenge. You I won was one, the right? I f- was the first ever winner at the LA Coliseum in 97. Is that right? The first ever winner. I've got a lot of firsts. People don't realize, but, like, like there's a lot of history that I've done in this sport. Like, the KJC being the first winner. Uh, 97, huh? 97. I'll try to find a photo of that. You have any pictures of that? Uh, yeah, there is for sure. Me, you have to send me one or I'll find one. And then, like, being the youngest rider to podium against Carmichael and Wyndham in the 450 class at 16 years old, two months, that's a record that will n- never be broken because all the kids these days, they start in a 250 class and they're more than likely 17, 18 yeah. years old. I was 16 years old, two months, and I went 5 4 for third overall against Carmichael and Wyndham in their prime with beards and you know they're just jacked and i'm on the podium with yeah. pimple face and a scratchy voice like just and i believe the hype t-shirt <laughs> yeah we'll, we'll forget about those but you know there's a couple like and then obviously the 350 at hangtown winning the second moto that's history in itself that'll never ever happen again nobody's mm-hmm. riding a 350 at the nationals yeah i mean that's something that will live in infamy forever because nobody's riding 350s anymore who did you race against that 
KTM Junior ch- Challenge Race. Who else was it? I think was it was Dennis Jonan, okay. I believe. Um, Jeff, my brother. Um, what did you, I, I always just think, man, what are these kids, what's going through their heads? It's got to be just overwhelming to be on that stadium floor and the lights and the people. And Yeah. I, do you it, remember much from it? Not really. Not really. Too little. Yeah. I mean, if I had to remember just I, being nervous and, you know, just anxious, excited. But at the end, of, I mean, at the end of the day, like. You don't have any, like, little memories that stand out from it, though. Not really, yeah. no. What about uh, amateur nationals? What Were there any amateur national races that stand out for you? Mm. Well, obviously, like Loretta's. I mean, obviously, being able to go there and perform and, and the the put in the work and the ability to go and win, it's huge. Like, it's enormous. And a lot of the amateur parents, you know, they don't maybe they don't understand it or see it or realize it. But I mean, to win eleven titles is is freaking hard. Like it's you, it's more just, than just one title, three motos in a row to get through. You're gonna have mud probably. Uh, I, I've always had some type of bike issue every Correct. time. I mean, it's just a lot of things. Just like any championship, it's a a lot of stuff has to go right. So what, what do you attribute all of those, that success to? So, um, I feel like you guys prepared. Really correct. Well. That was it. Yeah. Prepar- preparation, fail to prepare, prepare to fail. So we went there with the mindset that we put all of our ducks in a row, the bike, the fitness, the testing, the practice, the training, the motos. And we just went there and we would, we'd win mm. and we didn't have bike problems. Everything was for the most part, always smooth. And, you know, as much as you got to be fast, you have to be lucky because, yeah, you could derail a chain, bike could lock up, you know, shifter can snap off, whatever. There's a hundred things. Flat tire. I mean, I had a wood chip stuck in my carb the first year and we couldn't figure out what it was. So it would get up and plug the main jet and the bike would go, and then it would take off again. I'm like, (laughs) what's going on? You know, they put all the wood chips down. I don't know if they're still doing that, but anyway, there's a lot that has to go right. Um, so, who were your biggest amateur rivals as you started kind of winning? Was it was always RV? Was it RV? Yeah, okay. but you beat him Davey. most of the time. I beat, yeah. I mean, I beat RV every single moto except for one time. Did you guys get along back then, or was there tension? Um, we would talk like in the pits, but nothing like. You weren't, over. You weren't bros, but no, you we would you talk. Didn't hate, didn't hate each other. No, no, yeah. and we still don't. Like everything is good. Like yeah. uh, 2020, he parked right next to us at Glen Helen, and I was doing some preparation for Two Stroke National, and here he comes, like literally, like I mean, he couldn't have been any closer to our van, and he comes backing in, pulls the tailgate, and I'm like, I'm like, hey, bro, what's up? And I start helping him take the little PWs out to yeah. help his kids, and yeah. and uh, we ended up getting a picture together, and it was cool. We're like literally like from you and I, like just. Yeah. Just hanging out and it, talking. It's, it's cool when you, as we grow up, because I feel like, at least for me, I, I don't want to speak for you, but the guys that I was racing against, I didn't want to really be friends with them. It was harder for me to race them hard if I was buddies with them. Yeah. Didn't mean I hated them, but I didn't want to get to be friends, really. And then once you retire and you're kind of just past that, then it's like you're almost like uh, you've kind of been to war together. You know what I mean? You have a lot of in common with them, and so you, you get to be friends. You know, at least I found that for me, that it's fun now to talk with the guys that I raced against because yeah. there's no no more ego involved or head games or trying to I mean at the end of the day like we're all racers trying to strive for the same goal which is trying to win and you know there can only be one winner for yeah. sure I mean at the end of the day it just that's how life goes and um, you know we all put in work we all train hard and and try our best and you know it's just like you said you gotta have the luck on your side as well as the equipment and all the chips just have to fall the right way and man I've been in countless championships and 05 with uh, Tedesco and with Villapoto in 06, Langston, my rookie season in the 450 class in 07, battling James in 08 when he had the undefeated season, like I was the closest guy to him. And then in 09, you know, having the title with a 40 point lead and breaking my knee, like people don't realize, but I went through, you know, 05, 06, 07, 08, 09. I went through five different championship runs before I was barely like 20 years old, 21 years old. Mm -hmm. And I was, you know, still a kid and you know, uh, it's a lot of pressure for sure. And then, you know, obviously that 05 season with Tedesco, like if I didn't have a DNF with my shoulder popping out at Southwick, I won the first moto. Second moto, I got a second place start, came over that roller 
after the start where it drops down and I launched into a big old gnarly breaking bump, popped my shoulder out, DNF. Mm -hmm. Another DNF at Washougal Second Moto. Uh, the, the, the incident with, with GL at the first round where, so. where I couldn't start the bike and I tried to push it and I ended up 15th instead of a first. So right there in that position, I lost 20 points. So if you calculate those three motos, in, and, and, you know, obviously, granted, uh, Ivan had the bike problem or whatever at the last round, which made the championship from 35 points to 10 points going into the last moto. So it was like all this enormous pressure was on me mm. going into that second moto, where in reality, had I not had those problems in the beginning of the season, yeah. it would have been the opposite. I would have had the 35-point lead and would have been able to manage the last round. Yeah. And that's, uh, that's racing, right? Though, like that's what makes the sport so awesome and frustrating. And it like, was a lot of pressure. I was, I was, uh, just turned 17. So I think I was in 10th grade, 10th, 10th or 11th, <laughs> 10th or 11th grade. That sounds and, ridiculous. And, um, yeah, I'm, I mean, if, if we were okay at talking, we'll, about, we'll get there. Okay. We, we kind of like to go in order. I, okay. I'm, I'm a little OCD about that. So just, we'll get there. We're going to get through everything kind of in a row. <laughs> you got a whole um, checklist. I do. <laughs> so 04, uh, you turned pro. Yeah. And you did Millville and Steel City. Yeah, Millville was a flop. I crashed the first moto, was like, I think, basically last. And then the second moto, I was battling with Tortelli well, for, for wh fifth. Why did you decide to just go 450? Well, we we had Honda come out to Millville a couple weeks before to test the 250. And I was, uh, unfortunately, I was not happy with it. Okay. And I felt more comfortable on the 450, and that's what I had been riding, and that's what I was racing at Loretta's. Okay. So it was just an easy transfer, and basically Honda said, you know, you know, if you decide to go 450, like, we're not helping you from here on out after this. Is that right? So that's when a KTM approached us and was like, hey, if, you know, you, you know, you get X finish, top 10, it's, you know, this for next year. If you get top five, it's this pay for next year. And if you get top three, like you're claiming you can get, then we'll pay you the big cheese and, you know. Oh, is that right? Yeah. So that was before Millville or before Steel City? When, when did that no, no, conversation no. happen? Th this was all before Millville. Okay. So you had already had talks with KTM prior to that. Correct. And I went there and tested the bike. Hmm. What did you think of the KTM? Loved it. Because it was, that was it, pretty it, early on. It was gear driven. It was, it was not the bike that I ended up getting though. Mm. Because in Europe, you can do different stuff to the engine and it was a gear driven motor. And, um, it, it just worked different, mm -hmm. and I was instantly, like, hooked. I loved it. Mm -hmm. And when we tested that in June, we were at the GP, and it was, like, two days before the GP, just uh, testing I the see. bike. And then I loved it, and then and then went to Millville, flopped it. Then now, and before we move past that, I got, we got to talk about the T-shirts. Whose idea was the, the That was DMXS. Dude, okay, so anybody that's watching this show right now, that was not me, 100% sure. Not me. That okay. was the. D I never heard the origin of. It. That's why I wanted. Dude, to ask. it was DMXS Radio, and they just thought it would be a cool idea, and you know, we're uh, not me. My dad at the time was like, "Yeah, run with it. Whatever, it's cool. Like, yeah. not a big deal." Not thinking the reality of like the repercussion of it, and yeah, just I literally still have one or two of those shirts. And do you? <laughs> I mean, it's you know, you look back now and you can laugh at it, but at the time, some people were really like oh, yeah. offended yeah, by big that. time. Kevin was. Like, who does this guy think he is? Kevin yeah. was mad. Wyndham? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But, okay, so then move on to the following weekend. You go to Steel. What, what did you it take two, away? Two weeks, two weeks later. Did you take away anything from Millville? Like, what, what was the learning? Our uh, biggest learning was that get the flip off that bike that my dad made me race and, and give me back my Loretta bike. And oh, what did he make you race? What do you mean? What did you change? So I, I, did, I raced with Loretta's on one bike. And then went to Millville on the brand new bike, and the chassis was so freaking stiff; it didn't uh -huh. didn't flex. And I tried to tell him like I don't like this bike, but he was convinced that it was the bike I had to race because it was all fresh, all new suspension, mm. motor. So I said, "F that! I want to race my Loretta bike." And I went to Steel City and got on the podium. Yeah, and I did it in like, like how you would not really draw it up. I crashed the first moto, came from dead last with Reed. McGrath, uh, Joaquin Rodriguez, uh, Sebastian Tortelli, we're all down, like, in the third turn. And uh, Reedy jumps on the back of Joaquin. They both go down right in front of me. It's just a, it's just a pile up. Yeah. And I literally charged my freaking butt off from last to fifth, passing Kyle Lewis on the last lap for fifth. 
Sakimoto started right next to Reed on his right, and uh, Lewis was on his left. And we kind of knew, you know, obviously Reed's bike was going to be a little bit faster, so we knew he would come out and squeeze him. It's just it's 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 literally a chess game in racing. It's you know countering and activating and knowing where the riders are going and what yeah. they're doing and how it's it's almost like you got to see it happen before it even happens. So you we, guys are really good at that moves and counter moves, right? Like I can I can hear your dad's voice. You know, okay, so here's he's gonna he's gonna probably pull you, so he'll push this. So then tuck in on the outside of him. Like you guys have a whole strategy before the game. I don't have drops. the I have the picture on my phone. I have to look for it, but it's it's there. So there's Reedy, one left of me, and there's Lewis, yeah. two left of him. And then, uh, and then there's the action of that second moto, and there's Lewis getting yeah. chopped out, <laughs> and there's Reedy doing exactly what we thought, and then there's RC getting the whole shot, and there I am just Jeremy, kind of like a uh, Talladega night. It's like slingshot me in for a good start. Yeah, before I was a good, a really good starter. So not only do you, you know, you you kind of feel like you've proven yourself in the premier class, which just doesn't really happen like that um no it takes a progression it takes time it uh but you also just locked in your deal with ktm at a pretty solid no <laughs> solid it, i wasn't done until after that weekend was over i signed the contract the next day on sunday as we flew home but they said if you got third then it was this right so yep it was good it was good money yeah, yeah. so you had to be just that had that was a great weekend for you, I guess. Yeah, it was it was a couple hundred thousand dollars to a, a lights rider, which back then was a lot of money. Yeah, and unfortunately, we signed the contract, and then two days later, we tested the bike out at Honda Valley, and I clipped a branch, and it hit the front brake, oh. and the and the front end tucked, and I high sided on my shoulder, and and I was done. I couldn't race Glen Helen that weekend because oh. I was going to debut. The very next week and on the KTM. Oh, Glenn Helen was the final round that year. Correct. Oh, okay. And that and that was the year that RC did the 24-0. Gotcha. Hmm. Bummer. That would have been interesting to see how that would go. Yeah. But you were still on for the following year then with them, right? Yeah. yeah. And then that's when the whole progression didn't ride Supercross and went right to outdoors. And that's when the, you know, me and Langston had our crash and then. And yeah. So you, you did not. That, I'm getting my mirror. So it would have been 05? 05, yeah. You, you skipped Supercross. That was a strategic Yeah, that's what decision. KTM said. Yeah. They just wanted me to focus on outdoors. I think I was smart. I think more guys are have started to do that since then, and I think it's a great idea. Mm -hmm. To send a 16-year-old kid into Supercross. Right into battle. Oh, man, that's just. That's like that's like dropping, you know, a, 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 you know the Army dudes right into yeah. Vietnam saying, okay, <laughs> yeah. fend for yourself, you know. Yeah, a little bit rough. So what did you think of, of your KTM that you said it was different than that one you rode in Europe? You were not really hyped on it? No. <laughs> no. Did it, it get it, better or, or? No. It, no. It, it didn't have the linkage. It was it was garbage. Mm -hmm. But I made I made lemons. I made lemonade out of lemons that were not really lemons. It yeah. was like it was like trying to produce Rot results. Oranges. Yeah, it was like <laughs> trying to produce results on a on a no offense to KTM back, you know, 20 decades or well, they two came, decades they ago. They came a long ways, and that was very early. The bike was, I mean, it was not good. Yeah. And I was able to perform on a motorcycle that was half as good. I feel like half as good as, like, the PC bikes that I was racing during mm -hmm. that time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, was, yeah. Was DeCoster there already? No, no, no. That not, was, not that was in 11. Yeah. yeah, that's right. He came in way later. Yeah. Um, so who were you working with over there? Like, who was your guy at KTM? Larry Brooks. Brooks, okay. And then I was with Paul Delorier. Okay. That's Mike Larocco, who's my yeah, yeah. mechanic he's, for so many years. He's been around forever. He was probably a good resource for you guys, huh? Probably one of the best mechanics I've ever worked with, yeah. And okay. genuinely, like, w was there for me. Like, yeah. Like, he, he like, almost like a son, you know? Because I was a mm. kid, 16 years old. Yeah. Like, Yeah, you just need a lot of... Uh, guidance at that point yeah you, know? you don't know anything yeah. about ra pro racing and he does so that I, I remember going to this 05 opener at hangtown and it was hot that day it was hot really hot and that moto with you and gl was that that was the second, second moto, moto right what happened I, the first moto uh me and grant were battling and we literally both like popped ourselves at halfway and we both together just went backwards <laughs> like it was crazy and uh, yeah, we were. It was the first first moto of the year. We just went two hundred percent too hard, too yeah. hard too soon. Yeah, and well, the second moto was nuts. 
Uh, yeah, I whole shotted. For and people then, who haven't seen this, take us through it. It was a whole shot, and I was riding good. And I think it was Mike Brown who was right behind me and just pushing me. And by halfway, I it was weird. I just almost like loosened up, and I just pulled away from everybody. And then at like 20, 25 minutes in, dude, Langston was coming. And he got there. He got to me, and he came on the inside and, and – passed me for like one turn and then the next turn he fell over and he which was weird he was nonchalant like picked his bike up all slow took it takes his glove off shakes it out puts it back it was weird like like he just like nonchalant like well, it, it tore his glove off so the fingers were pulled inside out so he was trying to get the glove back <laughs> right right <laughs> it's just crazy to think like and then dude he just went just madman and he just Past all the guys, Hepler, Millsaps, uh, Grant, I mean, all the guys, Tedesco, just blew by them all. And, yeah. dude, he just starts reeling me in, reeling me in. And the white flag comes out, and I'm like, I can hold on for one more lap, but I'm so tired. You know, I was a kid and just pushing so hard. And, dude, he just, it was like, it was like he was coming. He, he was, was coming yeah. like a freight train. And then the last turn, he, it's like, a 90 a, degree left and then up of tabletop. At the finish. That was the yeah. finish. Yeah. And as he comes in, I mean, he like put his foot down and dabbed it and it twisted his ankle. And I think when it did that, it like shocked his whole body. And he like ghost rode his bike he, into me. Well, he caught the, he caught the hay bale with his foot and it twisted his foot and dislocated yeah. his ankle. His ankle, if you, I watched the video the other day and it's turned it's, the opposite oh direction. Gosh, it's so gross looking. It's turned this way. And so he's trying to pick himself up and get his bike started. You're trying to pick yourself up. No electric start back no. then. No. <laughs> and so, his bike was, of course, running, and mine wasn't. So he hobbles on, rolls over, and he goes over the finish. You see him look down, and his foot's going the mm -hmm. wrong way. And, and that's another thing in history to know that the dude who won the overall couldn't even do his interview on the podium. Yeah. Not because of me, just because of the situation that yeah, happened. Yeah. No, it was just a wild finish. Um, and the crowd was just into it. Yeah. Because, you know, so that, what did you get credited with? Because you, you were struggling went, to push the bike up I over went the seven fifty. Uh, 615 on the day okay so instead of the 25 points i ended up only making like five points that was 20 points <sighs> in just that one moto that you look back on in the end of the season with ivan how different that second moto would have been yeah like just right there that would have been instead of 10 points down to tedesco going into the last moto at Glen Helen for the title you're up i would have been up 10 yeah just in that one that one moto so you end up ninth overall that day, you end up winning the next weekend at High Point. Yeah, I went uh, one, two, and Brownie was riding really good the second moto. First moto, whole shot, one with a good distance, like 20 seconds. I just, it was muddy. Second moto, got, uh, I think, a second place start. And um, and me and Brownie literally just were going back and forth the whole moto. And, and then with two laps to go, I remember on the pit board, you know, P1 overall stay. So I was like, oh, okay, well, then I just take second and yeah. got my first overall and that was how was that what's that what was that feeling like i mean you huge huge i mean i was like i said a 10th grader you know just you know still in high school you know and barely getting hair on my nuts i mean just a kid and uh finally you know was able to deliver on what was promised and i, I believe a lot of people didn't really believe that it could happen um and, you know, to do it in the second try, like I did in the 450 class with podiuming in my second try, it just, I delivered on what I said I could do. Yeah. And. Yeah, it's super impressive. I There's something that uh, I want to get your opinion on. And I, I mentioned this from time to time because I think it doesn't get talked about enough. As amateurs, um, whether it's you who, who you were winning at, a, at the highest level, right? Loretta's, you 11 or 19 motos in a row, 11 titles. Um, I, you know, I obviously didn't have that kind of success as an amateur, but locally or regionally, I was winning a lot yeah. too, right? Everybody that becomes a good pro rider, they're winning in their local area all the time Yep. and, and getting some amateur national wins and stuff like that. Then you turn pro and unless you are like Stand one, out. one of these elite, you know, high level guys who just puts it together, you don't win that much anymore. No. And so mentally that's very Huge. very tough yeah it's very tough it, it's taxing too especially when you put your whole life into it and like for my family didn't didn't have money so like it was all in yeah so and is that you know how did you deal with that because you won there right and you did have some wins especially early in those years but 
then the winds, they just get hard. <laughs> they, just, yep. they don't come easy. So How I did su- you deal with that? Uh, it's hard to say how to deal with it because, you know, you got injuries and, and you know, just the way life goes, you, you kind of hit a plateau. And for me, like in my career, I've always been like having to like reinvent myself to be a racer or even just to stay relevant. Because if you're not in the spotlight, you get forgotten about in two seconds. Yeah. And I feel like just, you know, being a part of racing, even still right now, like it's what's keeping me going. Mm. And people see me, they hear me, and I'm still racing. And, you know, winning like two-stroke national or vet championships, like I know it's nothing of national caliber races, but at the end of the day for me, those are fun races. And I get to pick and choose the races I want to do now yeah. while still making some money and providing for my family. Yeah. No, it's awesome. I, and if you're still capable and, and, you know, it doesn't sound like you have too many injuries that are slowing your body down, huh? I don't. Yeah. I, I mean, I go, fa- I go fast. I just won't go over that limit. Like yeah. I know where that limit is now and I don't step over it. Yeah. Whether the guy behind me is faster or not. Yeah. I guess what I'm asking is, do you, in your head, do you go, okay, well, you know, second's still good, third's still good, you know, top five, it's, um, it's okay. Or are you like, dang it, man, like, I, why can't now, I just want to win? Or back then? Back then. I mean, is you're oh, in kind no. of the meat of your career. No, you have to win. You're paid to win. Yeah. But that's what's frustrating. And then if you there's, don't there's win. There's 20 guys who are paid to win, but only, usually two or three guys are doing all the winning, right? Mm-hmm. So it's frustrating. It's a very tough mental side of the sport where you have won all your life. You move up. You're expected to win. And, you know, like I said, only a few guys do a lot of that winning. And the rest, it's like, man, they're hard to get. Many are called. Few are chosen for factory rides. And when you're on a factory ride, unfortunately, you're you're paid to win. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, you've been there. You've yeah. done it. Yeah. And it's frustrating. And at times... I, I found myself settling and then you would realize like, gosh, why am I settling? Like I, I can win. Why am I not? Why is that not the standard? Why am I going, well, podiums are good. I'm up on the podium. You know, that's good. And it is, but we want to win. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? That's the name of the game. So anyway, it's tough. I just wanted to and know. And you were you close were. in, what was that? 19, 2000. 2000 in Dallas when that big, huge first turn pileup. Yeah. And you guys all came together, and you just needed, I think, one more spot for the championship. I remember that. And that was intense. Yeah, that was, I mean, that's racing, man. <laughs> that's, and then that's Be- Bentley wins it, and he's like, I I freaking won it. Yep, yep. Because they were still calculating the points. Like, Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Bones, like- Bones sent me a piece of paper he had, he kept from that night, and he's calculating up who finished where and what the points were, and he's got a math error on there, so it wasn't even right. <laughs> It took a while after the race was over to even figure it out. Um, all right. So had to feel good to rebound, right, and get that win. You guys are all pumped. Um, then it was Southwick. <laughs> then then Southwick, like you said, your shoulder popped out. That hurt you. Yeah, won the first moto, and I think GL was second. And, yeah, the second moto just popped my shoulder out. And, and then that was like a downward trend for a couple of weeks because the shoulder was still trying to heal while racing and yeah. kind of lackluster results, you know, fifths and sixths and sevenths. And it was like decent. And then, uh, and then I was getting, then we had the break and then, oh, and then red bud. Oh, that was what happened. I don't remember red bud. So first moto me and G- GL were battling literally to the finish line. I think I was less than half a second behind him at the finish and I got second Second moto, my teammate, Ryan Mills, and I was literally, like, yelling behind him, like, move, move, get the out of the way. You know, like, he was, like, holding me up so bad. Mm. And um, he ended up going on to win that moto, and it was crazy because he ended up getting fired, like, that, that at the end of the season, even though he won that moto. And I remember thinking, like, dude, if, if, I, if I just get by this guy, I got the overall. I'm riding better. I'm fitter, stronger, like. I got it, and I'm tr- and I go off the track, land on a hay bale, cartwheel, and I remember after the moto, like I was just so pissed what off. What did it. you end up? Do you remember? I think I was like seven or eight. A lot of points. Yeah. My clutch was all bent, and yeah, it that that whole O five season, man. I can look back on it and be like, I should have done this. The, the, yeah. G, the GL yeah. incident at round one, Southwick moto two, the red bud, you know, losing points right there to my teammate in moto two. 
DNFing the second moto at Washougal. Like, it's just those, all those points. Like, <laughs> instead of the whole, like, Tedesco situation at Glen Helen happening would have never happened because it would have already been over yeah. by the second moto. The championship would have been done. That, that's that's really tough because I had t- a couple different seasons where if one, if this one thing would have gone differently, and and one of them was my own fault. I was behind a guy, and if I would have just passed him, that was the championship. And I look back on that and go, I settled because I didn't think it was he was a factor, and I settled for second instead of going for the win. And that's where sometimes I realized maybe I sh- you know I I, I needed to be more calmer and, and do the settling part mm. and, and be calmer instead of trying to force it. And, and I think guys are different too. Like you probably were a little more like do anything to win. Right. Mm-hmm. And I, in my time, I was more calculated and I'm out there doing math in my head, you know, like, okay, he's, I was overthinking it and trying to be safe and smart. And I needed to be a little more like you. You probably needed to be a little more like me. You know what I mean? But every rider's trying to figure that balance out. It's hard. It's hard. And it sucks when at the end of the season, like you say, you go, gosh, if I would have just chilled out and taken a second. Mm -hmm. Or if I, and I'm going, dang it, if I wouldn't have settled and got that guy, that was it. I'm a champion, right? And that would, I mean, (laughs) and then, yeah, that season. And then with Villapoto in 06, I was, I played the consistent game. Like I didn't want to be the fastest like I was in 05. I wanted to be the smart guy. Second, third, take a win. I went 1-1 one, one on my 18th birthday at Hangtown the next year in 06. That was like probably one of my best best days of racing. Well, let's, I want to talk about 06 because that was a great series too. But let's talk about Glen Helen. Um, first moto, Tedesco has bike issues. I can't His remember chain what popped off. Is that what it was? Yeah. So then the points were really tight. Six. It went from 35 to 10. Okay. And that should have never, you know, all he literally had to do was just ride around in 10th place and the title was over. Yeah. 10th place. So you, like that. you came down that sand straight or the mud straight, whatever they call that thing. You were on the inside and. Well, it starts more before that. So we were on the starting gate and I had Langston on one side and Walker on the other. And I remember it's like the craziest thing going off the start and I'm literally bouncing left and right off of them going down the start straightaway. Yeah. So that kind of got my blood <laughs> yeah. boiling, you know, before we even get to the first turn. Okay. And luckily, I'm like, I pass them both on the first lap. I'm just going insane because I'm just mad. And uh, and then I see Ivan, and I'm like, oh, I can just, I can get him right here. And I just drove up the inside. And the way that, that sand section back in the day, if anybody remembers the sand at, at Glen Helen, they had this mud straight away. So it was all ruts, but it was really wide. Like, we're talking like a like a truck length wide, yeah. like, and pretty much you either went far left or far, far right. Yeah. And so length, uh, uh, Ivan was far left. I was far right. And the way the corner convened, we just, we just met at the intersection together. Yeah. And, and when we connected, we both fell. And at that point I was like, Oh, I'm screwed. My bike's not running. I guarantee it. So my first thought was, you know, obviously being whatever I was 60, 17 years old, I so much pressure on me and just, just, I just, just I went kinda, straight. For, I went straight for the kill switch because I knew, I knew my bike wasn't running, and I knew in order to make the the to be even, I needed his bike to be off. So we're both starting together. Yeah. yeah. And he was smart the whole time. He kept the the clutch in while trying to like get to his kill switch, and yeah, just lost my mind being stupid. You know, seventeen year old kid, and it's a lot of pressure. You're young. You're going for a title. Yeah, well, the pressure was between motos. It was like it was real, like something that shouldn't even have evolved into being something that was real happened and, yeah. and made the second moto a reality that I could be a champion at 17 years old mm. and, you know, 10th, 11th grade, you know, kid. Like, I don't know of, I mean, obviously Pastrana did it and James Stewart did it. And there's, I mean, there's not it's few, n- few there's very, few. very few. I mean, it's like rare air to be a champion in the lights class at, as a teenager. Mm-hmm. And um, did you ever... Talk to Ivan after that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're good yeah. now. Okay. Like anybody who's watching me and Ivan, totally good. It's water under the bridge. Yeah. Yeah, it was a, it was a wild scene, you know. But like, and then and the you worst- listen to David Bailey on the broadcast too. And he's <laughs> like, yeah, you know, he's young. He was going. He was almost kind of defending yeah. you, going, look, he's a kid. It was going for the title. I think kinda- Ivan at that time was close to thirty or maybe thirty years old. So he was literally almost old enough to be my dad. Yeah. He had to have been. So- yeah, he was. He was mid to late twenties for sure. Yeah, yeah, 
different different world. You guys are definitely at the opposite ends of your careers. All right, so that year ends. Um, 06, you stay with KTM? Yep. I was, I was KTM 05, 06, 07. Okay. And then, it go, so did the bike improve going into 06? No. <laughs> okay. no. It's the same, same bike. <laughs> okay. Um, so, I looking through your results, and I've got them all here printed out. I was 1-1 one, one at Hangtown, and it was a mud mud race. And, yeah, it was like the, like the fairy tale, happy 18th birthday. Yeah. Like 1-1, one, one, led every lap. Pulled one tear off, like it was the the birthday that you could like dream of and never get that I got. Yeah, at Hangtown. At Hangtown, on the day it was my birthday. So take me through the rest of that season. I mean, it's not much. To and, s- and as you look through the results, you were had you had that opening win, but then it was like you had so many seconds, in seconds a row. and thirds, smart, crazy, yeah. smart all the way through. Villa was the fastest guy. Not the most consistent. And I was playing the most consistent role being, okay, you know what? I don't want to do what I did in 05, being the fastest guy. But then I got hurt, yeah, inconsistency. Yeah. So I did the opposite. I changed my whole game. I was like, okay, 06, we're going to be take a third here, a second here. If we got to take a fifth here, whatever, just be consistent. And it was working all the whole season. So if the red plate back then was on the bike, it was literally on my bike, off my bike, on my bike, off my bike. Because Villo and I were like back and forth, back and forth. He had a couple of DNFs with the engine pop at Southwick, one moto, and then Washougal, another moto. So um, I just was consistent. And then, of course, uh, at, at Broom Tiago, I got the whole shot and came out of that right hand over that roller. Just a weird... Oh, it went off the track. Huh? Yep, and I like hit the, the, t- the front tire, like popped, and it like kicked me weird. And as I fell, the clutch lever snapped. And uh, that was it. And and then looking back on I it, I wonder because you picked the bike up and it shoots it launched. Off. Yeah, yeah it just took off because the clutch. Mm. And then they told me after the race was over, they're like, "Dude, all you had to do is be smart and race the race." RV fell in the first turn. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> and at that moment, the title was done. It was over. So, <sighs> and then and then went to Glen Helen, knowing I couldn't win the championship and. It was over after the first moto. Yeah. Well, you know, I tried my, I did my damn best to like be the guy to get, to get the points every moto, take a win when it was available. Was that uh, uh, broom round your only DNF? Correct. Yeah. yeah. Only, only moto. Man. Yeah, that's crazy. Well, and <sighs> RV was so good. You just. He, you know, he you, was faster. When, don't when get you, me wrong. When you race against guys like RC, uh, like Wyndham in his early days, especially like RV, you you just you can't give an inch, right? Like if you if you give them, you get a tenth, that's it. They're not going to get a tenth. Dungey, yeah. the same way. Not going to happen. He's on the box every time, yeah. every single time. And that's time. what I tried to do that season. Oh, dude, you Wa- damn near did, dude. Washugo, oh my god, that was intense. At the the corkscrew at the drop off, that little left right. Yeah, fans hanging over, flipping me off, and just booing me. Oh, it was in, just intense at well, Washugo. Was that you guys battled? And I want to say he he took me off, you the, off the yeah, track he, in the little because he left, DNF right. the first moto, and then he tried to clean me out the second mm. moto. Really, and they were they were <laughs> the crowd was yeah. just into it, like which is it's like mixed emotions because in that oh six season the crowd was like f you like because they were all you know they wanted RV to win it's their hometown boy. Yeah, yeah. Then you fast forward six years later in twelve when me and Dungy were going for the title, and I beat Dungy that first moto at Washugo in two thousand twelve, and the crowd was cheering me on to beat Dungy yeah. to be the only guy to beat him that season. So it was like. At one spectrum, in the beginning, it was like they hated me, and then when yeah. I was battling Dungey for the overall or for the Moto win, they were loving me. So it's like yeah, it was kind of cool, kind of like <laughs> re- redemption, I guess, from the Washugo fans. Well, at fans. least you know it's nothing personal. No, right? no, it's, it's just they just want their they yeah. just wanted their guy to yeah, win, and yeah, it, was, yeah. it was all good. All right, so um, this was an interesting. So in 07, yeah, uh, 250 Supercross again. You rode East, I want to say. A lot of right? people don't realize I only did two years of Supercross, or. 250. Uh, 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 yeah, 06 yeah. and 07. 07. Yeah. That was it. So I was already straight to the premier class before I was 18 did or you, 19 years old. Did you like moto better? Like, did Supercross? Yeah, Supercross always came hard to me. Yeah. I just did not naturally, like, good at it. Mm. I always had to work at it where motocross was just naturally gifted to, like, just pin it and go. Yeah, you, you're good at high speed, like, yeah, just that outdoor stuff. Mud, ruts, no problems. 
I, I was curious what, what you thought about that. So you did 250 East Supercross. Bike was still no good? Yeah, no good. I crashed. <laughs> okay. Yeah, you know, I had bad finishes. I did. I, the one race I did do good at, which was Daytona, I got third. Okay. And, uh, yeah, that was a good night. And but was, that, that wasn't your Hanny one, was it? No, no, that was... Oh. That was 05, yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, I was there in 06. So then you moved up to the 450 class outdoors. What was the, what was the, I mean. Top 10. You, tried, you tried, already had some success, your second race ever on a 450. So you're probably like, I can do it. Why yeah, wouldn't I move up? Well, I was coming off an injury too from riding the 250 East. Mm. That, and that's why at that point I was like, dude, I'm not a 250 rider. I'm a 450 guy. Mm. So, Which is so strange because you're, you're not a big dude. No. You just like the, you just like to ride it. Yeah, but I'm strong. I am strong. Yeah. Big muscles. <laughs> no, no, not even big. Not even big. It's just, you know, just strong core yeah. and strong legs. Obviously. You, yeah, you ride it well. And for me, that, that outdoor season, it was, okay, we're going up against Carmichael and yeah. and and, Re, and uh, Stewart. It was like, okay, but, like, let's be realistic. Let's just be top 10 at the first couple of rounds and be consistent. And then maybe we start working toward top five and maybe a podium as – as the season goes on and I get healthy. Yeah, but you killed it, dude. So you were second overall in the championship in 07. Correct. And you did five podiums in a row to close out the season. Correct. That's I hit I hit a stride at, at uh, Bud's Creek. No, 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 not Bud's Creek. Red Bud. They gave me a new shock, David Phillipart's shock from Europe, and instantly was like, oh, done. Went from being barely like top five or top ten overall straight to podium. And I don't think I was off the podium after that. Yeah, you're, the end of the season is like. So it, it, I was talking to Tim Ferry just a few weeks ago because we were at the same race that he was at, and we always reminisce like that 07 season. It's never happened in the history of racing ever, and it never will happen again. Four riders going into the final round with a legit chance of the title was Langston, Andrew Short, Tim Ferry, and myself. I came in fourth in points, left that day second in points in the championship. And how, I, how many were you out of the? Who, who was leading and how Langston. many? Langston. He he ended up winning by I think by fifteen points over me. Okay. And of all four of us had a legit chance at a title going into that that last yeah. round, even the last moto. And wasn't Stu leading and then he blew his knee out? Blew his that, knee out Washugo. And that right. was done. Okay. Yeah. And then R C was just did the first couple and then he was done. Yeah, yeah. Huh. Yeah, that was and, a, that was fun. Because it was like everybody had sort of gone, Okay, Stu's gonna win this. Yeah. And then it was like whoa, you, re, like re, re, rejuvenize yeah, the yeah. series, like totally. And then all of a sudden, Langston he he hit a spurt, like kind of like when I did, he yeah. did, but at the very end. Only difference is he was freaking winning, and I was seconds and thirds. And I think he had a frame change. There was something correct for at, him yeah, at Unadilla. He yeah. had a frame change. And he's he's a very much an opportunistic guy. Anyway, if he smells blood in the water. Mm. It's like I know it in 05. Yeah. He did it to yeah. me at, at the first round at Hangtown. I mean, uh, you know, he he rode good. So yeah. I always kind of like reminisce with with Red Dog. Like, hey, just just reminder. Remember, I came in fourth in points, and then passed you for third in points after the first moto, and I beat Shorty by one point to get second in the championship. Mm -hmm. And I remember I was so pumped because I got a four hundred thousand dollar bonus from KTM. And I took that money and I bought my my RV that I had, and I was so pumped. I had a brand new RV uh, that was three hundred seventy five thousand. I was like, brand cash. New. <laughs> Tell me, talk about the difference in in the shot, because you know we people ask this a lot. Like, what are these guys talking about when they say they found a the setting linkage. or whatever? It, but it, the, the back back then the bike didn't have linkage. It was a piece like a piece of junk. It really was. What was I'm, it? Uh, what was the name of the thing? W D P D S. It was the P D S system, yeah. right? Yeah, and it just it. It just didn't do its job when hitting square edge and bumps. Well, progressive damping system, I think, is what it was stood for. It was like, instead of having a linkage that has this constant ratio of progression, mm -hmm. you're trying to do it all with valving. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. It does not work. You're going to always give something up. Yeah. Trust so, me. I, I, my, the bike I raced in 2001 <laughs> and 2002 had no linkage. You and think your bike was bad. Yeah, dude, it just... It just didn't work, but yeah. in order to make it work, you had to ride the balls out of the bike, and mm -hmm. that's what I was able to do. So what did that fill apart shock do? That It just made the bike just, just absorb and work properly, and at mm -hmm. that point, I was like, oh, we're, we're competitive now. Mm -hmm. And I just went on a run of thirds and seconds, got my first ever moto win at Steel City, the first moto. And, uh, yeah, it was a, a, a great yeah. – it was a season that started out, like, really dim. I was, like, barely 10th at the first round. 
And then the the bike got better. I was on the podium. And it was like you just watched the results just like they were like 10, 10, 5, 7, you know, whatever. And then it just went straight to thirds and seconds mm-hmm. and 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 then finishing second in the championship. That was huge. And I was so pumped when I got that bonus. I was just well, over yeah. the moon. Jeez, that's like, uh, you know, five years of income for most people. Yeah. Um, okay, so you you left – and went to Suzuki for 08. Yeah. Tell me how that came to be. So I sat down at the office at KTM, and they literally offered me a million bucks to stay, $1 million. And I said, thank you. No, thank you. I'm going where I feel like I can win. And I went to – That Suzuki was really good at that time. Carmichael, too. dude, it's proven. Yeah. I mean, the guy just was there. I had his locker in the semi. I had his mechanic. I had his motorcycle. Like, all the pieces were there. And, Did you uh, take a big pay cut to go there? Huge, massive, massive. How much? I think I ended up getting paid two fifty. <sighs> but it didn't matter because I knew I wanted to win. Yeah, yeah. And in but the that's bo- a lot. It's not like a couple hundred grand. Well, I made a lot of it in the bonus money, finishing second to Stewart. I was getting second, 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 which was like seventy, eighty grand for that mm. second overall. So, you know, the first five rounds before Red Bud or four rounds, I was always second, and then. And then in 09, I won back to back rounds, and it was 100 grand for the win, and then 15 per moto win. So you make 130 each weekend. So from one Saturday to the next Saturday in a seven day span, I made over a quarter million dollars mm-hmm. just from winning. And then I broke my knee. Yeah. But okay, that's, so fa- that's fast forwarding to yeah. too far. So the bikes, when you ride this thing for the first time, compared to your KTM, how much better? And it, talk about what that bike did, because to me, like when I watch Reed on that thing, even it just stuck like glue. Oh man, it just it stuck like glue. The turns, the thing would turn like crazy. It was solid. Yeah, that's it. I mean, there's nothing more to say other than mm-hmm. it, it just it did what it needed to do. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Um, so way better than what you were on. A did, significant. I mean, night and day better. I mean, we're talking apples to oranges i mean <laughs> yeah did you did it help in supercross for you at all i was i was third in points at at the time before i did my collarbone in in uh, san diego mm-hmm. in 08 i was third in points okay it was i want to say oh man you're talking over a decade ago i think it was i think it was reed first Wyndham second and i was third in mm-hmm. the championship okay in the 450 class not a 250 class right, it, right this right. is the big dog class so you did the collarbone and then you're out till the summer yeah, well, Roger wanted me to come back. I was like, dude, no. Like, let's just focus on outdoors and try to give this thing a real run and, and win. Yeah. And it was working yeah. until I crashed at Red Bull. How, how did it work with Roger? You guys get along well? Honestly, we always got along great. It was just, I mean, obviously my dad and him, you know, just, it was like it was like two of my dad. Like, it was yeah. my dad going against himself, like, <laughs> against Roger. So, no, with Roger, like, I still have a great relationship with him to, to this day. I see yeah. him at the races. Hey, Roger, how you doing? Shake his hand. Yeah. Like, totally fine. It's all good. And the motorcycle was just phenomenal. Like, it was, like, just, like, like cushion, like a pillow, like, riding it just was perfect. Mm. And, um, yeah. Hmm. Did he help you with anything specifically? Like, is there anything you remember that he told you that stuck with you? Mm. Just always try hard. That was pretty much it. He even signed a poster for me. Yeah? Yeah, I got a poster from him. <laughs> I still have it to this day. Of my garage in my da- at my dad's house. So Red Bud, um, as I was prepping for the show, I watched that video again, dude. It, it's ugly. It's nauseating. It's maybe one of the ugliest, grossest crash scenes I've ever seen. Yep. Yes, sir. Um, and obviously <laughs> you don't remember much of it other than a quick swap and the lights were probably out, huh? Yeah. Well, the way they, I mean, I do remember it, you know, but the biggest thing is the way they graded the landing all the way to that roller was stupid. Yeah, you're who going the, 100 miles an hour. Who right the there. hell rips at the base of the, the drop-off there going 100 miles an hour, and then you're kind of like trying to get on the brakes, and as soon yeah. as I got on the – kind of like didn't even get on the brakes. I just, just let, let off, off the, the throttle. And the thing just like dug in and yeah. freaking pitched me. Yeah, take if it's rutted, take the dozer and just track it. Yeah, right? they but did it don't, wrong. Don't rip it. Dude. They ripped you know. it. Um. What did you hurt? Because like guys keep landing on you. I mean, I I can almost not. I can't even look at it. The TV when it's happening. But it, everything was good until uh, Balby landed on me with his frame right on my shoulders, both scapulas, and then like pretty much all the ribs on my right side. 
puncture a lung? Or no? no, no, no. Flail segment? Did they call it that? Like if you break ribs in multiple places? I don't no, know. I don't no. remember. I just remember we had to drive all the way from Michigan and my, my motorhome all the way home. Oh, my god! That was brutal. Uh, While being like, you know, concussion and not right. Yeah. Going through the altitude in Denver. It's, <laughs> that you, was not a fun you drive. Had, you had a handful of concussions. Uh, I saw one knockout in Daytona. Um, I don't remember what year it was. Daytona? Yeah, there's a you're in Daytona and you get knocked out somewhere. There's one No, you're talking about Hangtown. I, there's Hangtown too. I'll have to send you the Daytona clip. I No, I wasn't knocked out. I I just I couldn't move my back. Oh, you hurt and, your back. And, okay. And the doc the, the the guys were like, "Hey, are you okay?" And I'm like I'm like, "No, my back. I can't I can't feel my legs." Oh. Like I was like I felt like I was like possibly like, like a stinger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm like I'm like I don't move me and they they're like we have to, we have to. And they literally like picked me up and took me off the track. And I remember thinking after that, like, when my feeling came back, I was like, how the F did they do that? Like, why did they wow. pick me up when I said I can't move? Okay. So you weren't, you didn't get a no. concussion. Okay. No. You were just laying out on the track. And I'm like, Ugh. yeah, I, I couldn't, I was like, like paralyzed for yeah. 30 seconds. Scary. Uh, the Hangtown one is pretty dirty. Yeah. Well, I was fastest in the first, pr- which was the overall fastest of the practice of the day so i was first picked for the first moto and i couldn't even race because i was knocked out <laughs> this, i don't know why there's a camera on you have you seen the footage yeah of it? it was just the way that like i came out of that turn and hit the face and then like it just like just rebounded so gnarly yeah yeah it was pretty ugly <laughs> like i wasn't even expecting it to just like pogo me and, yeah. and the way it just like sprung me off the bike i went further than the motorcycle yeah <laughs> Your dad comes running up, you know, the asterisk guys are all checking yeah. on you. He's like, Mike, you were going so fast. <laughs> and you go, where am I? <laughs> I don't mean to laugh, but the scene is pretty yeah. funny. Um, so you've had some concussions. Do you have any any issues from that? Headaches or like no. nothing like that? Okay, good. Okay, so what about 09? It kind of, you know, if you're looking at, well, sorry, let's finish 08. Uh, 08. Tell me about the knee. No, that was 09. Or that is 09. Okay. So in 08, yeah, I recovered fairly fast, three weeks. And I remember telling Roger, I'm ready to come back. Like, let's go. And you did it at high point, right? Like on a stake uh, or something so, like that? Or? Yeah. I, are we fast forwarding to 09 or are we still in 08? I can't remember where the hell we were. You, you, we were talking about 08. Okay. Um, so in 08, I was coming back from the. You had red butt. And that was. I was done. Lights out. And I called Roger. I'm like, hey, three weeks later, I'm like, I'm back. I'm ready to go back to riding. I got back on the bike, felt great, was ready to come back. Roger said, no, like, let's just insist, like, let's get ready for Supercross, you know, testing and preparation. So I was like, okay, whatever, like, kind of holding me back. Because I recovered in three weeks. I was ready to come back. Yeah, you could see his point, though. That's a pretty significant. Yeah. But to yeah. him, he thought I was, like, in bad shape. Where in reality, like I healed super quick, mm. and I was right back up to speed once I started riding. Even with your ribs in three weeks. Yep. Jeez. Okay. And this was, you know, obviously beginning of July. By the beginning of August, I was already ready to go back to racing. I could have still raced the rest of the season of August. Yeah. And he said no. So then we just kind of transitioned right into Supercross. And on my second day, Reed was my teammate that season, and um. We were at the Suzuki test track, and he, we were looking at this quad, and we were kind of both eyeing it up, and he swore he could do it, and he <laughs> he kind of, like, baited me to do it first, and, oh. and, I, and I went for it, and I did it perfect the first time, iced it. I'm feeling, like, on top of the world, like, high-fiving, like, yeah, I'm the man, and go to circle around and do it again, and just clipped it, and then rode the nose, and then went up the berm, like, to the moon. And, you know, I jumped off the bike, landed, broke my leg. Done. Uh, I don't remember that. Huh. Yeah. So Preseason. Yeah. yeah, I still got the screws right there. Okay. Yeah, it wasn't an open fracture. You just had to have screws put in. Yeah, screws. Yeah. And, yeah, it was right here. I got this weird dent that's still there from mm. that day. And I remember Tom Carson having to, like, lift, pick me up, put me into the the van. And that was, yeah. That, was that doesn't feel good. Yeah, and I didn't even start riding the Supercross again until December because that was... In s- yeah, that was September. I didn't even start riding again until December, correct. And then, obviously, Supercross being just a few weeks later, I mean, I was super unprepared. Mm-hmm. And I still qualified for the main event. And 
actually progressed through to Supercross season and got a podium, my one and only podium in the 450 class with Stewart and Reed at Indianapolis 09. Hmm. That was my one and only Supercross professional podium. And that was a huge deal. You know, my dad wasn't there. He was driving from California to Florida. And I, I don't even remember back then if you could listen to the race because you couldn't watch it. But Oh, no. I don't, I don't remember. I don't think remember. so. And I remember him calling me, like, after the race, like, so, like, excited, although bummed because he couldn't be there to see it in person. Yeah. And it was like, I remember thinking, that's the one time my dad's never been to a race, and I podiumed. And I almost won the freaking heat race, too. Did you, do you feel like him not being there sort of took some pressure off you? Uh, maybe. I don't know. I mean, it's hard I, to say. I had to have that talk with my dad early on. We... I was a, a dick and got in some trouble before we were going to Mammoth one year. Yeah. And my dad was always just, he wanted the best for me, but he was, you know, like a lot of our dads are, pretty... Pushy. Yeah, they're pushy, right? And and uh, he would put a lot of pressure on me that I was already... It's like, I'm putting enough pressure on myself. And so I went to Mammoth with a friend. He goes, you know, screw it. You go with him, I'm, I'm out. Yeah. I did the best I'd ever done at the time. It was yep. the best I'd ever done. I got a third to Decker and Huffman, and I was like... I came home. I said, Dad, look, listen, I love you and stuff, and, and I, I appreciate everything you do, but like, you're look, staying home. Look what just happened. I didn't have the pressure of you breathing down my neck, yeah. and I rode better than I've ever ridden. It's crazy like, how that works. And he didn't like to hear it, but he, he, he backed off, and you know, I started doing better and better from there. So, anyway, I just curious. I, if, remember, I remember after that race, too, when I podiumed, like, we, Roger was so happy because Reed won, mm. and my teammate. So, Suzuki was one and one three. three. Like, yeah. that's huge. Yeah. He was so happy. He's like, what are you going to do to celebrate? And we're like, nothing. We're going to go back to the I remember walking back to the hotel. It was freezing, snowing. And I got my podium trophy. I'm like I'm like a death grip. I'm yeah. not letting this <laughs> thing go. Like, any fan comes up to talk to me, I'm going to get gonna, away. Yeah, stay away from me. This yeah. is like, this is mine. And, uh, yeah, Danielle and I uh, went back to the hotel. Dude, we just went to sleep and 6 a.m., flight back to florida it was just like like a regular routine yeah you know night and then uh back to florida and then we were prepping for daytona because that was the following weekend and that's where i love jay law he's a good dude he did some kind of some shifty stuff that night where he cut the first turn in daytona in daytona yeah he fully cut the whole first turn like that was i remember i think he should have gotten that. docked at least some positions or time but he didn't and uh um, you know, I'm winning the race and just being smart, consistent, saving my energy, just being smart. And I uh, ended up running third on the last lap. Me and Millsaps, he comes and cleans me out, takes takes us both down. He gets on his bike first. I cross the line at fourth. And I remember thinking, like, dude, like, that was my podium back-to-back mm -hmm. -back weekends. And Lawrence kind of stole that from from us, in a sense, because he cut the track. And, mm -hmm. and that was What did he end up? Second. Mm -hmm. He he led to like four laps to go, and then Reed got him. How do they not dock him for that anyway? That's I mean, a whole full. Story. That was the one where Stewart and Burner big pile up first turn, and he literally just makes a hard left, cuts like five hay bales, yeah. or tough blocks, and just right across the first turn. How does that something like that just be overlooked? But anyway, well, it doesn't matter. Yeah. So then we go through the Supercross season. I'm still riding good. Another fourth at uh, New Orleans. I was fourth, uh, fourth, fourth or fifth in that main event. So it was like okay. I was on a third, should have been a third at Daytona, then a fourth or fifth at New Orleans. Then I went to Seattle, and that was RV's backyard, like right in his backyard. Whole shot led till I think lap 14, 13 or 14. And it's just him and I just, it, it, there was like, it, it didn't seem like anybody was, it was just me and him, like okay. amateur racing. And the crowd was just jazzed, loving it, just into it. And I just washed out the stuff, just a basic washout. And I get back up, and I think I'm in third, maybe, maybe fourth, and I'm battle, battling with Stewart. And, uh, and Stewart kind of like goes over the triple, and, and I look at him, and he looks at me. And I end up fourth that night in the main event. Come off the track, I'm thinking, oh, you know, Roger's going to be pumped, you know, leading all these laps and almost winning the race. Like, he'd be excited he wasn't pissed that you fell huh? no know. no he swore that i gave james the nod to like let him by hmm. he was mad and i told him I'm like dude like it wasn't anything like that at all i just looked over at him he looked at me 
whatever. And yeah, I remember. I don't see you giving someone a position. Like that doesn't seem very Michael Essie. Yeah, James was. I mean, he was riding good, and yeah, he wasn't. He wasn't too fond of that. Huh. That's weird. So then, you know, when the championship came down to Vegas, and Reed, I, I was legitimately riding good in Vegas that last round, and I was literally doing everything I could to like let Reed by my teammate. To like go, like go, dude. You need to be up there, not here back here with me in fifth. Like, so, yeah. And he did. I can't remember what happened. He didn't. He tried to take out Stewart. Remember? Remember, like, uh, like probably more than halfway through the main event, he knocked Bubba in the back section. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. He yeah, tried I to. He that. tried to knock him down. And. Um, huh. But anyway, I, I remember too. Like the next night after Seattle, like. We were on the same flight as James and, and Big James, and I told him, like, hey, this is, like, what happened, what Roger said, and he pulls out his wallet. How much do I owe you? <laughs> no, he didn't. <laughs> I swear, just as a joke. That's uh, funny. He's like, how, how much How much you paying you? How much you paying you? <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty funny. All right, so this summer looked like it was going to be your summer. Yeah, it was, 100%. You know, me and Villo, we, we were the head of the class, and and then he went out the second round with a knee injury. Um, and I went 1-1 at Hangtown, 1-1 at Freestone. Super hot that day at Freestone. It was nasty hot. And I remember them saying on the TV, like, this is Carmichael-esque, you know, 45-second lead. He's gone. Like, it's over. And, you know, feeling good. I was fit. You didn't overcook yourself? A lot nope. of guys got nope. kind of damaged. So then that I day. flew Sunday to High Point because DC wanted me to do like a little press ride to get, you know, the cameras and people motivated in the area for the race. So I did that on Monday. And while I was riding, there was that back section in the like the back area where you don't really see anything. It's like a double-double. It's where Grant crashed yeah. in 09, where his yeah. bike continued and then hit that truck. That section, my dad's telling me, like, you got to do this. You got to do this. You got to do the 3-1. It's going to be the difference in winning and not winning. So, you know, I'm sizing it up. I do it, you know, no problem. Did it a couple of times, four or five times. But then the one time, I just kind of overjumped it. And the way that I, like, kind of hit my head on the handlebars, it kind of knocked me silly for a second. And I, like, bounced and went into the grass. And then as I hit the brakes to slide to slow down the the grass I like it was kind of wet oh. and I slid faster into the fence and then right at the last second I see the fence and I try to like brace for it and turn into it and I hit the post and as the post the front tire hits it bam snaps the, snaps the kneecap didn't even fall oh, man. I just came sliding into your, the, your bar hit, hit yep, your kneecap? the, the oh. handlebar and because back then they didn't have the the kneecap that was extended now it was the whole thing yeah it was only to protect this part so I had this Gap. gapping that mm. you can't you can't do nothing but which they do now and of course the handlebar boom right in this just the perfect spot done and i remember davy coombs picking me up putting me in the truck taking me to the hospital and dr perdome did that surgery that night and he's same same guy who did my wrist this is this, this pittsburgh uh it, medical center or where was it uh morgantown oh in morgantown okay and that's the guy i trusted he he did my he did my ankle he did my knee and did my wrist huh. So without that guy, I mean, I might not be a racer anymore after all the injuries I've had. So, yeah, that was intense. It was a huge bummer, like, just trying to, you know, do, just be a part of something to help out the race. And, yeah, I got hurt. Ah, like, stupid. So frustrating. Yeah. Well, then you came back. There was more drama because you came back at Colorado, right? I did, yeah. I was that the next round? Three, it was three weeks later. So okay. barely three weeks from getting surgery. And I'm literally like hobbling and barely able to walk. And, and what was the motivation to do that? You were still in points? I was second in the championship. Mm. Even after that many rounds? Yeah. Jeez. I had a 40-point lead, which is unheard of in today's world after the third round to have yeah. a 40-plus point lead. So the the... What I remember from that race, I don't remember where you were. I was way – I qualified 30th, so I had, like, a terrible gate pick. But I made it work and still was, like, second or third in the first turn. And there was, like, a little right off-camber weird rut or yeah. something before that tabletop. And, and JG just fo – he, he saw an opportunity to, like, get rid of me, and he he took it. Yeah. Did it re-injure the knee? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It, it was basically what the Dr. Perdome told me is, like, I had to remake the knee out of Play-Doh. Because it was still fresh three weeks from surgery and had to do another surgery. And then and then I got an infection during the second surgery and then I had to come back another month later and do another surgery. 
So that that was just a long effing summer. Mm -hmm. And because I didn't, uh, because I got hurt, they didn't do my contract for another year. They fired me, fired Thule, my mechanic, one of the best mechanics I've probably ever had in my career. Tool time. Tool time. Mm -hmm. And it fired him. So didn't get my contract renewed, didn't get the million-dollar bonus for the championship that I should have gotten, and I was gone. Didn't have a ride, and KTM comes knocking, and, hey, you want to ride a 350 and, you know, be a part of something that's never happened. And, um, I mean, I didn't have any offers. Mm. It seems crazy to me that you wouldn't have offers after starting that series the way you did. It's just the way the sport is. It's so cutthroat. Yeah, and, and if spots are full, I mean, they're full. You know, I guess I don't know who was where at the time, but yeah, that's crazy. Hey, let's take a quick break. This is your Troy Lee Designs timeout. Stay tuned. We'll be right back with more Michael Lessie. Fellas, have you started spring cleaning yet? The carpets need cleaning, the drapes need dusting, and your lawn needs mowing. Spring has sprung, and the global leaders in below-the-waist grooming have the best tools for cleaning aisle five in your pants. Time to clear out your winter bush and join the other 4 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped by going to manscaped.com for 20% off plus free shipping globally using the code Whiskey Throttle. Manscaped has the full package you need for spring cleaning this year. The Performance Package 4.0 is the only tool you need to keep your boys looking and smelling like the fresh tulips your partner wants. To start off your spring cleaning, use the Manscaped Lawnmower 4.0 trimmer to get the most precise shave on your hedges. Did we mention it's waterproof as well? No need to worry about water in your grass with this tool. Equipped with an LED light so you'll know it'll be a major asset to the new shower routine. Clear your holes and smell the spring air with the Weed Whacker. This nose and ear hair trimmer provides proprietary skin safe technology, which helps prevent nicks, snags, and tugs in those delicate holes. After clearing your nose, make sure you get rid of that foul ball smell with the Crop Preserver and Crop Reviver. Uh, the Crop Preserver is an anti-chafing ball deodorant and moisturizer. The Crop Reviver is a spray-on toner for your balls. Keep your boys from sticking to your leg and leave them smelling like fresh flowers. Finish off your grooming routine with the Plow 2.0, the perfect razor for the finest shave on your face. Because if you're using the Lawnmower 4.0 on your balls and your face, you're doing it wrong, fellas. The start of spring also marks the start of Testicular Cancer Awareness Month in April. Manscaped has partnered with the Testicular Cancer Society, to bring awareness to testicular cancer, men's health, and early cancer detection. Manscaped is committed to raising awareness for the most common form of cancer in men aged 15 to 35 and giving support for fighters, survivors, and families impacted by testicular cancer as part of their We Save Balls initiative. Smell oh so fresh and so clean this spring and check yourself before you wreck yourself. So, Get 20% off plus free shipping globally using the code Whiskey Throttle at manscaped.com. That's 20% off and free shipping using the code Whiskey Throttle. No capitals, no spaces over at manscaped.com. It's time to throw out your old hygiene habits and upgrade your life. Dunlop. There is a reason every AMA championship in the past decade was won on Dunlop tires. They are the best. Choose the best performing tire and a brand that has never wavered in their support of our sport. Choose Dunlop. Pro Circuit. Pro Circuit products are designed with one goal in mind, winning. Through passion and hard work, Pro Circuit has operated the most successful 250 team in the history of the sport. They use that same formula when developing exhaust, engine, and suspension parts for every brand. When only the highest level of performance is acceptable, trust Pro Circuit. Since 2009, Seat Concepts has been dedicated to making the best aftermarket seats. More comfort, more grip, more riding. For 10 years, we've continued to raise the bar. Innovation and American craftsmanship make Seat Concepts the world leading manufacturer of power sports seats.
Something from nothing. That's what Nihilo Concepts is about. It starts with a spark, an idea, a concept, which leads to a design and finishes with engineered excellence with the highest quality products created with durability in mind. All our products are made in the USA at our state-of-the-art facility in Stewart, Florida. Whether you are a weekend warrior, ride for fun, or at the highest level of competition, Nihilo Concepts offers innovative titanium, aluminum, and carbon fiber parts for your dirt bike. We offer a wide variety of products that you can customize to your liking. Browse our site for foot pegs, brake tips, engine components, specialty tools, frame grip tape, lever grips, carbon fiber components, motor stands, our secondary on-switch plus much more. Head to NihiloConcepts.com and see for yourself why factory teams like Red Bull KTM, Rockstar Husqvarna, Troy Lee Designs Gas Gas, Orange Brigade, Club MX, KLM Gas Gas, and some of the fastest riders in the world choose Nihilo Concepts. Since 1987, Coach Rob has been dedicated to creating durable motocross, supercross, GNCC, and road racers through his complete racing solutions program, integrating performance, nutrition, functional strength, flexibility, and mental development. His proven system has world-class results, producing four AMA number one pro plates and over 270 national championships. The complete racing solutions program focuses on the fundamentals of human physiology and how riders interact with the physics of a motorcycle. Its proven process and system helps riders understand the why associated with riding techniques and how getting faster on a motorcycle directly correlates with strength, endurance, nutrition, and flexibility off the bike. There is a difference between a fast racer and a Complete Racing Solutions racer. Visit CompleteRacingSolutions.com and get on the path to becoming the champion you want to be. Specialized Bicycles Specialized leads the way in the world of bicycling. Whether it's cross-country racing, downhill, e-bikes, enduro, road, gravel, dual slalom, dirt jumping, or all mountain bikes that do it all, Specialized has the perfect ride for you. The brand is synonymous with engineering excellence and innovation that steers the industry. Visit your local Specialized dealer for a test ride and see just how good Specialized products are. OGO Power Sports. OGO has perfected the carrying case. Motocross gear bags, helmet bags, boot bags, hydration packs, backpacks, and travel bags, to name a few, have all been meticulously engineered to maximize space and surpass durability standards that would make NASA proud. Simply the best, OGO Power Sports. Connected. intercom on to be able to hear what they talk about and how fast they should go, throttle control, braking, really cool. Extend your leg out, there you go. Good job, good throttle control, Lonnie. That's a great training tool. It was a lot of fun to be on the track with them. Hey, Lono. What? Can you pull off, pull off over here when you get to me and your brother? Okay. With a rich history in motocross, ProX has been dedicated to supplying quality components since 1975. Whether you're rebuilding an engine or just need a new chain, ProX Racing Parts aims to bridge the gap between OE quality and affordability. ProX has over 9,000 part numbers and over 60 different product types that are manufactured by highly reputable or even OEM suppliers and are offered at affordable prices to help keep riders on the bike instead of in the garage. Visit ProX.com to search parts for your bike or check them out at your favorite online or local dealer. Audio the guys are just breaking in their race bikes, which will leave on the semi this Saturday to go to the first Supercross for our coast in Orlando. Uh, so the guys are just be goofing off a little bit, do some cool photos, do some cool videos. When you go racing, you want to do well, but a big key is keeping the bikes on the track. That's why we chose to work with Motul. Expectations coming in as a rookie is just to try and get my feet wet and uh, honestly just send it, see where I end up and uh, do my best out there, but just ride aggressive and ride like myself in practice and I uh, should have a good time. Challenges of this sport, I believe, is just simply staying healthy. Uh, with how fast we're going um, and what we're doing, your margin for mistake is really, really small.
Stay sick. If you have little rippers, then you have had to have seen Stay Sick Bikes by now. We have created bike and experiences that allow kids to develop sooner and empower them to find their own ride. From learning to ride to sharpening skills, the Stay Sick Promise is accelerated growth. Whatever path your family chooses, it's going to be the ride of your life. Stay Sick Stability Cycles. You ever heard the phrase that the harder you work, the luckier you are? Well, at Luck Apparel, they believe in an acronym that kind of sums it up a little more simply than that, laboring under complete knowledge. So it isn't just some random chance that determines what your outcome or results are going to be. It's being educated and working your butt off to get it done. And I think that that goes hand in hand with the motocross industry. You don't get lucky into a win. You work your ass off and you make it happen. So check out Luck Apparel. They've got T-shirts, hats, sweatshirts, all kinds of cool stuff. And we're stoked to have them on board here at the Whiskey Throttle Show in 2022. If you're in the market for a toy hauler trailer, car trailer, cargo trailer, look no further than Custom Outfitters, one of our new partners for this year. Uh, these guys do an awesome job, even so far as to dial in the inside of Sprinter vans, which have become the new standard moto transportation for moto. Uh, these guys can handle it all. Uh, they use ATC world-class trailers, uh, top shelf service, and performance in their products. Uh, Custom Outfitters out of South Dakota doing an awesome job. We're stoked to have these guys on board this year. So whether you're looking to just do some camping with the family, uh, looking for a trailer that can fit all your toys to go out to the desert or wherever, uh, look no further than Custom Outfitters. I'm on vacation every single day because I love my occupation. Hey, hey, I'm on vacation. If you don't like your life, then you should go and change it. Welcome back. That was your Troyly Designs timeout. Uh, if you are into mountain biking, TLD has a full complement out there. Uh, the helmets, whether you're looking for a stage, which is an awesome enduro type helmet. Uh, I basically just don't even use a cross country helmet anymore. I'm in that stage full time. I figure if I'm going to go down, I would protect my, uh, my teeth. My folks spent too much money on braces to knock these things out. So um, great mountain bike products. If you're into that, look at all the TLD lineup over there. Obviously, all their moto gear is out. The SE5 helmet is launched, and it's incredible. Uh, really redefining what safety means in terms of helmet protection. So check them out, TroyLeeDesigns.com. Uh, all right, Mike, jumping back in here. We wrapped up in 09. That, that season, man, just when you're looking through the results and, and kind of you could see you building momentum and then the knee, you know, just a bummer. Um, tell but, me what happened at the end of that season. I, I can't, I just, it still blows my mind. They don't, no one offers you anything. You end up going back to KTM. Tell me how that happened. Yeah, so like I said, the 09 season was over and contract was done. They got rid of me, got rid of the mechanic and just kind of cleaned house. And I was kind of left with nothing. Luckily, KTM called and was like, hey, you want to debut 350? And I was like, okay. I mean, it's the only offer I got. So I took it. And Did you ride that bike before signing that deal? Uh, no, I signed. I went to Austria and signed the deal and then rode the bike. And it was it was fun. I I actually did like the bike. It was a great bike. It's just not a, it's not something you take into combat. You don't no. take a pocket knife to a sword fight. And, yeah. And uh, so anyway, I went to the Des Nations that year in '09, and did my contract. And I watched the Des Nations because it was in Italy, and um, I was you know happy with the bike. I was actually liked it. I mean, it was a homologated for Supercross, so I had to miss all Supercross. So I started at Hangtown. Mm. And preparation went good. I was happy with the bike. Um, even starts were good. I was happy with it. And went to Hangtown and went 4-1 for second overall. Got the whole shot second moto. Let every lap. Won the overall. Had the overall with two laps to go. But your rider, Townley, fell mm. and gave Reed that third place instead of fourth and Reed would have went one four and I would have went four one for the overall. And that would have been history in itself to debut a whole shot, a moto win and the overall all on the same day. So and BT was nursing. He was coming back from injury. He only had cool. like three weeks on the bike. Correct. So he was just tired. He yeah. did. He did great for, you know, where he was. So, so I remember watching that race and, and thinking after like, man, that three fifties for real. I yeah. mean, it's well, it was it was good on the track, just not on the start. Yeah. And so, and this is what I tell a lot of people in that 2010 season, 
if you look at the way they graded the start, they didn't grade it. They had a roller, which is weird. They don't. They didn't rip it for some reason that that season or that that race, and the the start was like very minimal. Like we're talking hardly anything. Mm-hmm. And so I got the start. I think it was Metcalf, and I think it was Townley next to me. And I got the whole shot. Let every lap. Won the race. The very next fucking ra- the next weekend they ripped the start so. Which was deep. what high point? No, it was Freestone. Oh, Freestone. And the and from there on the rest of the season I never got a good start again except for one race, and it was the only other race I podiumed, was Southwick. When Dungey won the championship that day, I got good starts. Mm. Do you know why? You can't rip sand. Yeah, you sand can't, is sand. You cannot rip sand. And, of course, I got good starts. Went uh, 4-3 for second overall and was on the podium. Mm. The only other race I got on the podium was that, that, that race in that season because I got good starts. And was Shorty riding that year with you, or that yeah. was another year? Was yeah. Shorty also? Yeah, he was. No, no, no. That was in 11. He was on Honda in 10, and then he came to. Okay. And then Roger came in 11. Because he, I remember talking to him about it. He just said there's times on the track he really liked it, but there would even be spots in Supercross especially where you needed to just. The grunt. Grunt right out of a mm-hmm. turnover. Something. It wasn't there. Goes, yeah, it's just not there. Nope. And he couldn't make up the time in turns. or nope. So you're just giving something up. Everywhere. You know? Yeah, it was a fun bike. Don't get me wrong; it's yeah. a great bike to ride for fun, like a vet rider. It's just in a professional race, no. Yeah. So uh, I, you know, you still put in a pretty good season with them, fifth overall, right? Uh, yeah, in fifth, the championship behind behind your guy Townley, yeah. who was fourth. Um. So what happens at the end of that season? Then everything kind of trans. Well, I wrote. I went to Australia, did the Supercross series over there. On the 350? On the 350. And then, like, Roger called me and wanted me to come back early because I needed to do testing in December, which I did. So that was cool living in in Australia, in Cronulla, just outside of Sydney. I was there uh, end of September, all of October, all of November, and then I went back the beginning of December. So I got to live in Australia for a couple months. How was was that? It was awesome, honestly. Like, I, I... Tell people all the time, if there's anywhere else I could live other than where we live now in Florida, I would want to live in Australia. Mm. The people are awesome. The the weather's awesome. It's just not a dirt bike area because the dirt is terrible. Mm. It's like concrete. Oh, really? And everything's just like dry and baked. Mm. And Unless you can find a sand track, which is great, but tracks are far and few to find out yeah. there. Yeah, especially there. Everybody kind of lives near the coast all the way around. Yes, and correct. The middle is like... I mean, literally from me to you was the beach, and we had an apartment that we had that the, the people got us, the promoter. I mean, this thing was like probably five or $10,000 a month for rent. I guarantee it. Wow. And we were like from me to you on the water, like overlooking the ocean at night, windows open, listening to the breeze and the waves crashing, wake up in the morning, watch the surfers surf. It just was awesome. Like yeah. it was a great time. Um, and then obviously, yeah, I had to go back to America, do my testing, get ready for Supercross and just kind of all that prep. And and that was, uh, so you were with them again in 2011? Yeah. Yeah, and that was with Roger. And, and 350 again? 350 and Supercross, 450 outdoors. Okay. Okay. So how did that season go? Supercross was, you know, kind of hit and miss, whatever. Just the results weren't really there. I, I'll be honest, I wasn't really even into it because I didn't like – if you don't like the bike, you're not motivated. You're yeah. Not, it, it, was, it was like going to the race knowing I was going to get smoked every weekend. And I remember struggling with starts, and I legitimately didn't qualify, I think, at one or two races that season. Like, I legitimately just couldn't get good starts, couldn't get in top nine for the heat race, and I failed in the LCQ. Mm. So it was like I wasn't even motivated. I was over it. So I rode the 450 outdoors, and then, of course, I was first fastest at Hangtown in practice. And then the second practice, I had that weird crash. Oh, that I, was the – okay, that was that year. Yeah, I wasn't sure that was that the, That was the opener at Hangtown. Okay, so you didn't even get to race that day. Didn't even get to race, and I was qualified P1. Mm. And I think back then they were given those Oakley Bomb Awards, and I didn't even get to receive it because I was at the hospital. Mm. That was a bummer. And then I had to miss – I think doc, back then it was the asterisk. They, they had to – I had to miss two rounds. Oh, really? So, so I had to miss um, – Colorado and was it still Texas at that time? I think Texas, yeah, yeah. Freestone. You had passed the impact test. Yep, and all, that. all that kind of stuff. So I came back at High Point, and the I was just kind of like nervous, like, and I kind of like the gate, like, kind of flinched, and I went and I busted the gate out, and 
and I don't even know how it just popped out. Like it didn't even get stuck in the front wheel and <laughs> just blew the gate off the hinges. Yeah, it's just weird. Like the way it flinched and I just went and busted the gate out, ended up third that moto, which was cool. Like I rode good, but they, they're like, Hey, you hit the gate, so we got a dock you position. So I went four. So I was like, Okay, no big deal. Like felt good going to second moto huge downpour i mean like the biggest monsoon they had to delay the race because of lightning and thunder and everything i mean the track was a mud hole Mm -hmm. full mud hole whole i knew whole shot dude just sprint go i had a huge lead like 30 seconds 40 second lead it was massive on the first lap it was like 10 second lead and you know i was riding good and we got into the lappers by like the third lap and there was two riders down i tried to go around them but the rut like as i tried to like pop out of it because it was so deep and muddy i clipped them fell put my hands down done gloves were finished so i picked the bike up still winning but i was i was helpless i couldn't i couldn't grip i couldn't clutch it was just i was helpless so villo got me dunge got me and i think it was reed got me so i went four four for fourth overall okay and still not bad i mean still a good debut to come back from the, the injury and then uh you know, it was consistent. How did how did you get good in mud? Like we don't have mud out here. I don't. I, well, I was terrible at mud as a as a kid, and then I went to Zach Osborne's house and lived with him one summer in two thousand one in Virginia. In Virginia, yep. Okay. And then since then, I've been a better, not a great, but better mud rider. And yeah, like I just got I got decent at okay. it, better, but not not great. Yeah. Well, good enough to check out and be leading a national. That's not bad. Yeah. Okay. Well, I rode good too in Mill when they had the huge Millville downpour. Yeah. Oh six. The most atro. I mean, I'm talking like. So we're halfway through the moto. I'm kind of backtracking here, people. So it's an 06, me and Villapoto going for the title, and we're back and forth. And all of a sudden, the monsoon just opens up. I mean, the track's perfect. One lap. The very next lap, we come and it's rivers going down yeah. the downhill. The very next lap, because it was just the, the the gods just opened up. And uh, it's just the track is destroyed. I'm running fourth, and it starts downpouring. Shorty slows down. Villo slows down. I pass both of them, get second. I'm thinking I got I just won, like because Hepler, he was gone. Okay. <laughs> but he's a good he's a better mud rider than me, obviously. So um, I get second. I thought I won. I was pumped. Like I got the overall. I just went three one for the overall. Hugging the wife, you know, we're celebrating right there on the side of the track, and I'm just like, yes, I won. Get to the podium, uh, he- Hepler won. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> like, damn. Whoops. <laughs> Whoops, whatever. But, I mean, the downpour of the track changing dramatically in, you know, 60 seconds or 90 seconds, I adapted to it really well and was able to ride really good once the, the, the conditions got ugly. Yeah. And where the other riders kind of slowed down, and I kind of almost sped up. There was something weird about that mud, too, because guys who are good in the mud, Villeman. Struggled. I'm, I, he looked like a novice. Mm-hmm. I, I was announcing a TV for the Nationals that or year. Or Bubba. Bubba. When I he mean, tried to get around yeah, Villeman yeah. And, and, like, ghost rode his bike passing him. There was guys who were good in mud who looked like they've never ridden a bike before. Fish out of water. So there was something about it. Yeah. I don't know if it was just really, really slimy slick or I don't know, man. It was a that was a wild mud race. You have to, and that's another thing with racing is you have to be able to adapt to the conditions as they change dramatically, mm-hmm. and that's what makes a rider, you know, a good rider or you know, a great rider. Yeah, being able to adjust. I was never great at that. That's why I was more. Su- I like Supercross better because it was more consistent <laughs> yeah. that way. In a dome, uh, and a- I was terrible in mud. That's why I asked about the mud. I, I grew up Arizona and here, and it's like. We don't get mud. So. And I was born and raised in California, and I was terrible in mud. Then I went to Zach's in 2001. And and just went out in it, you know? Yeah. Oh, yeah. We just, when it rained, we went and rode. Mm-hmm. It was nasty. That's mm-hmm. so what you got to do, though. I tell guys now, because, you know, when I was a kid and I'd go to a track and it was for a practice day and it was over water and it'd be a little muddy, I'm like, I'll wait. I'll wait till it Mm-mm. comes in. I tell kids now, no, get out there. Mm-hmm. Go slop it around because <laughs> that's not mud even. You know what I mean? You're gonna see mud when you turn. To mud pro. is mud is mud when it's an unexpected downpour during the moto, like it did in Millville. That's that's mud, and, yeah. and and the conditions are very not ideal, and you have to adapt in, you know, a lapse notice. Yeah. Or red bud in practice at any time. Yeah, it's always <laughs> deep there. <laughs> yeah, um, okay, so 2011. How, how, how the rest of that season go? 
Uh, so me and Kennard were kind of battling back and forth for a lot of overalls. Mm -hmm. There was like Millville, for example. I went 4-4. He went 5-3. We tied on the overall. And then there was another round. Um, can't exactly say where, but we same thing. It was a 4-4 versus his 5-3. More bonus money that yeah. I missed out on another podium, you know, to, to add to the collection. But just how it goes. So, yeah, the 11 was over. I was... And you missed a bunch of rounds. You still ended up... Uh, fifth. Fifth, which yep. is not nothing to sneeze at. Yep. You missed... I missed two rounds. Two rounds. Yeah. Well, well, technically it was three because of the first one. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Three rounds. But because I came back and was still consistent, top fives almost every round and mm -hmm. almost podiuming, um, yeah, that definitely helped. Okay, so how did you wind up back on a Suzuki for 2012? So the end of eleven, well, even during the eleven season, they were Roger was convening with Dungey to mm -hmm. get him there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, obviously, like, it, I saw it all, and I knew what was happening. So it was like I was being replaced with him. So I need to go look for a new ride. So um, Monster Cup didn't have a ride and just went and got a Suzuki and qualified second in practice and um, didn't have the greatest results. I think I was, like, fourth or fifth or sixth or something. I don't even know. It wasn't great. Okay. Um, and then that night, Mike Genova approached me and – we went out to dinner and we're talking and next thing you know, he offered me a ride and that's where I, pretty much my home has been since 2011. Yeah. So I've been with him, give or take, you know, here and there for the last decade. I don't remember them on Suzuki's. No, they were on Yamaha's to begin with. And then, okay. and then when I went there for 12, we were like, hey, let's do Suzuki's. They're way better. Were you able to get any factory parts from nope. them or no? No. Well, I was in the outdoors once I started doing good. Oh. They gave me a clutch and funny how that works, a lever though. and some, you know, the roller, different stuff like that. Yeah. Um, and then I ended up, yeah, second in the championship that season, which was pretty dang good for, uh, you know, a privateer team and being able to to battle and beat Dungey that first moto was yeah. huge. Not just not just because of the win in the fashion I did it at Washougal where it was the home race for moto concepts and smart top racing. Like that was all the employees were there. They were over the moon to to be a part of the race and see me win and the fashion I did it with the crowd just super yeah. into it. It just it jazzed the whole team and and uh is definitely a special moment yeah. for not just myself, uh, you know, the whole team involved and and the in in the company as a, as a whole, leisure yeah. concepts and moto concepts. Well, that season, man, if you start looking on on paper, was really good for you. Sixth overall in Supercross. Yep, that was uh, to to this date. That's my overall Supercross Motocross best best uh, overall season. season was sixth in Supercross. In the 450 class and and second in outdoors. That was, to date, my best. Yeah, you had nine podiums that summer. I mean... Yes, correct. And I had one... Uh, I don't think I had any DNFs that season. No. Oh, yeah, I did. Unadilla. Uh, Rattray's bike was down, and I went to miss it and hit the water pump, oh. and the bike was done. And that was one DNF. And again, you're, you're competing against Dungey. It's like... That that's kind of when I was talking about earlier how, he, you know, when I raced it was when I started out it was Wyndham, right? Like he was just always a little bit better, and mm -hmm. then Ricky comes along, and then it's Ricky, then James comes <laughs> along, and it's like, damn it, you had them all. Yeah, I can I one just time. can I just please have a season with no you know iconic legends? And so you're in the same boat. You're competing against these guys. And hey, you know what? I mean, I don't mean, mean to detour, but they say you're only as good as the competition you race. And I can honestly say in my career, I raced the absolute, not taking away from you, the absolute best. Carmichael in his prime, Stewart in his prime, yeah. Reed in his prime, Villo, Dunge, Kennard, Reed. I raced them all. And yeah. at one point, I either beat him in a heat race, beat him in overall, beat him in practice. Like I remember beating RC in 07 at Red Bud in practice by one tenth of a second on the Saturday practice. And and he comes back. We're you know pitted you know across from each other. KTM Suzuki. He comes in, throws his helmet, throws his goggles. He's cursing. He's pissed. He's mad. Over one tenth of a second that I beat him by in in a practice that means nothing on Saturday. Yeah, 
Well, his mom was probably all over his but, ass. <laughs> but, my, but my point is, is I raced the absolute best at this sport that has seen, at least in the last decade, two decades, Carmichael, Villo, Dunge, yeah. Stewart. Those Reed. are legendary guys. That's, that's and, I, and I raced them, and, I, and at one point I either beat them in a heat race or in overall, in a practice, whatever. It doesn't matter. I raced the best, and I can honestly say that that was the best part of my career. Yeah. Yeah, it's good, man. I, I, you, you were in the mix and battling with, like you said, these are guys who if, if you're building a Mount Rushmore of moto – there's a few of them on it. And people don't realize, <laughs> but dude, I was one mistake away from winning a title 05, yeah. 05 06, 07, 08, and 09. Yeah. And with Dungeon 12, like, had he had one mess up, I mean, that championship would have been another one. Yeah. So you, you, from that point forward, you're with Moto Concepts. Moto Concepts. Yeah. Um, all right, so going to the following season. You, you, that was great summer. Yeah, it was a great, great year. Great year. Yeah, we're, yeah, yeah. we're all on a high. And then we go to uh, Dortmund in Germany, do the overseas races, make a couple of bucks. You know, you get good start money, yeah, so it's yeah. nice. And I win the heat race, and in between the heat race and main event, I'm like, hey, I'm not, not sold on the way the suspension's working, so we make an adjustment. CeeLo was my mechanic back at the time, and he, he uh, did the adjustment, went to put the bike on the stand, and I went to slide it, and I still have it right here. You can see it. It broke the it broke the the tip of the finger when he dropped the bike. Okay. It landed around my finger, s snapped the the tip of my thumb. The frame or what hit it? What were? Yeah. So when I went to slide the stand under, my finger oh. was under it, and um, I'm dripping blood. My finger's broken, and I'm going to the medic. And people are like, "Hey, where's Alessi? Why isn't he racing the main?" And I got hurt between oh, the heat and the main, so that was a weird deal. So. Luckily, still got my start money, which was I, good. I think I saw you at a, a German Supercross. It was the last Supercross I ever did. Uh, I came over with Chad Pedersen, and Larry Ward was there with us. And there was, um, what's the one where you'd win a car? It was a crappy little. That's, that's. Was it Dortmund? That, that's Dortmund. I think it was Dortmund. Dirt was like Play-Doh. Play so sticky. sticky and ruddy and, and I, nasty. You might have won. Did you win that weekend? What year was that? Oh, 11. 11. <sighs> you're, I think you're thinking of uh, Stuttgart. It was Stuttgart. Stuttgart, 11. I cleaned the whole weekend. Yeah, I remember watching just going, damn, Mike's going fast. That was <laughs> when I had just signed with Moto Concepts going okay. into the 12th season, and I was, I, was, I was extra motivated because of Roger getting rid of me to yeah. you know, have Dungey be the guy, and you know, I was motivated to – and I, yeah. I'm not a guy who runs because I got bad knees – I was running like almost every day. Oh, really? I was so you running. Were super hyped up. I was. I and my dad, you know, he, you know, he lets me do my own training because I know what I need to do. And it, you know, I couldn't run because of my knees, you know. And uh, I was motivated to to be good that next twelve season, and that's why I feel like I was really, really good. Yeah, it paid off. Yeah, I remember that race. Uh, <laughs> it was the last Supercross Chad Pedersen and I both did. He got cross rutted jumped off the track, landed on the concrete, broke both of his ankles. Oh, boy. I was just so uncomfortable because I was on a stock bike. <laughs> I think I had stock suspension even. Like, I just kind of was winging it, and I was super uncomfortable. Larry Ward didn't qualify the first night, and then he won the second night or, or podiumed maybe. Do you remember that? No. Anyway, I think it was I a think, weird Oh, weekend. I think I know what you're talking about. You're talking about 2004 that, at Dortmund. That that might that's have what it. you're thinking yeah. of. That might be it. This is w a lot of years before. Because you were on a KTM, Correct. Yeah. I had just signed my contract. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I was just coming off my shoulder injury. Remember how I was talking about yeah. signing the contract, got hurt, and then that was like one of my first races okay. was over in Europe. I did Bercy and, and Dortmund. Yeah. I just remember you doing really well. But I couldn't remember the year, but that and sounds And Dortmund, right. it was the same exact night as the huge mud race at Anaheim opener with Carmichael and Wyndham and Stewart, the perfect storm. Oh, that's that right. was the same night that Kevin won that night. That's right. That's funny. Okay. So uh, moving on to the next season, 2013, seems like this was a little bit tougher year overall for you results wise. Yeah. Oh yeah. I, I still because, on Suzuki's. Uh, yes. Well, because of my thumb, I can't, oh. and this was, you know, end of December. So it was like literally just days before. Did you have to pin it or anything? Or? Nope. Nope. We had to just let it heal. I yeah. had to put it in a little brace thing and yeah, just had to muscle through the okay. first round with a hand guard on one side. And, um, but yeah, Supercross 
kind of hit and miss. It was a couple of results there that were good, but overall wasn't that great. What about the summer? Summer, kind of the same thing, man. It was kind of hit and miss. You know, a couple of good results like uh, Colorado was was good. I think I was like, I think I went four four for fourth overall there. Um, I don't even think I saw the podium in thirteen, honestly. And then, um, and then the other good race I had was was Washougal, that thirteen. Um, I legitimately got fourth overall that day, but they scrapped my points the the whole finish because of the situation with my oh, brother. Oh, the laser gate yep. kill. So that that whole race was wiped out. Like I legitimately rode good and got fourth overall, fifth overall. Like I rode really good. And everything got wiped because of that whole situation with mm. with my brother. Unfortunately, yeah, that you know, was and that, that kind of you, you mentioned that kind of yeah, that was just a moment in time where kind of hurt your relationship with them a little bit, like it caused a little family rift. Yeah, I was really mad at him for a lot of years, man. I didn't even talk to him for I think there was a point where I didn't even talk to him for a year, maybe even two. Mm. I was so mad. I mean, he cost me ten grand that I had to pay the AMA, and I got my points all stripped, and it was just him being you know being stupid in the moment you know doing yeah. something dumb and for what reason we don't all, we will never know because he probably doesn't even know what he was thinking yeah well as a grown adult you know you you look back on that and you're like why he, would i'm you? sure he regrets i'm sure oh, for like, sure that was stupid. for sure and it, it's something that we, you know we try to move on from and people tell me all the time like oh you're you're laser gate and i'm i have to take it because he was part of the team that year with the Moto Concept credential and doing something stupid. So, and I got, I'm the one who had to pay the fine, the $10,000 fine, yeah. points I, all gone. Kind of sucks that you took the hit on all, all that. of it. Yeah. All of it. And people to this day still think I'm the one who did it when I was in the race. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, people uh -huh. don't understand that situation that just a moment in time where my brother was uh, not being smart. It is what it is, man. Yeah, it is what it is. So 14 through 19. Yep. Then I went to... Tell, tell me, was that when you started going to Canada? Canada, yep. So you would do Supercross here? Motocross, motocross there. Motocross there, okay. Because it would start June 1st, which was right after Supercross started in okay. middle beginning of May. So, yeah, uh, I was top 10 that season in Supercross in 14 and then went up to Canada. Started the season perfect. I won my first try and... I think people were a little, like, surprised. What team were you riding for? Moto, Moto Concept, Concept okay. yeah. We all okay, went up yeah, there as a you, team. We went up there in uh, 14 and 15. Okay. But 15, we only did just, like, I think one round. Um, but in 14, we did the whole season just to test it out, see how we liked it, be a part of it. Everybody treated us great. We enjoyed it. Um, we had good success. We won the most motos and most overalls of, of any rider in the season. We just had that one race at Gopher where, um, well, actually it was two races. Looking back on it, I, I ran out of gas on the last lap oh. with like a thirty-second lead at Gopher, and I missed the, I missed the finish line by it was twenty-nine fifty-eight to get the two-lap card, and I just missed it, so I had to do another lap. So had I not, let's just say I would have cruised from the pit board to the finish line just two or three seconds, that would have made the difference, and I you know, would have won that moto. Mm. So um, ran out of gas on the last lap, two turns from the finish, and you're not allowed to give gas or anything like that. So I lapped up far enough. I think I was seventh. So I still had a decent finish. It was like, yeah, seven or eight. Okay. And um, let me think about it. No, I'm kind of thinking about it. This, this is quite a few years ago. So no, I was no, I was in the teens, actually. And I think I ended up seventh or eighth overall. So I was like in the teens, like 18 or 19 in that first moto. Second moto, we didn't know what the hell was the problem. So we got to start, and at uh, 20 minutes, we stopped in the pit real quick and did a gas stop to fill it real quick. Oh, really? So <laughs> just to make sure you were Just gonna, to make sure. Yeah. So um, I pull in, you know, with a 15-second lead or so, and I literally pull right back on in front of Felciati. And, like, just right in front of him. And out of the mechanics area, people are just like, dude, this is insane. We're watching NASCAR going down. Like a full drill, like, brrr, like doing the gas pop, they just off, gas it up, go. And it was just insane. Uh, won the moto and ended up 
uh, I think, like I said, seventh or eighth yeah. overall. And, um, yeah, we... Well, you were still on a Suzuki? Suzuki, yeah. So they had... Um, I'm thinking this is around that same time. Did Was Brett Metcalf riding for Factory Suzuki here at that time? Correct. Yeah, because he got the ride because um, somebody got hurt and they needed a fill-in. Well, do you w- remember he got hurt? Because but I think it, he was the fill-in at Cowie, if I remember right. Well, maybe it was a different year, but that bike hasn't changed, and they had a Supercross tank and yeah, an yeah, outdoor yeah. tank. Yeah, the tank only goes so many... So. After the race, we realized it had a crack in the in the tank, oh. and that's where the gas was coming out. Okay, he was had a Supercross tank at Glen at Helen, Glen Helen broke, prepping for nationals, and, and bro- I was out there that day when he got hurt, broke his leg. Mm-hmm. Yeah, anyway. and, and he was like, I think at thirty minutes or twenty seven mm-hmm. minutes, and the thing ran out of gas. Yeah. And Suzuki's are known for not having a big gas tank, which is weird. And after the race, they're like questioning me, like, "Dude, were you riding the bike wrong, or were you in the wrong gear?" Like. I'm like, no, like I was doing everything normal. Yeah, that's what I normally do. Yeah. And then come to find out, yeah, had the tank had a crack and it was the big the the big CMR tanks or whatever. Okay, yeah, I gotcha. Um Fasciati is fast, huh? Like legit. there's some dude good dudes up there. He's legit. It's it's I've always find it interesting because we've had like Dusty Clack come down or Darcy Lange, which he actually did pretty good. And they think JSR. they're gonna, and they think they're gonna go up there and clean up and they don't. Well, when those guys come down here um, other than Darcy, he did good in Supercross. That uh, maybe oh, it was when I was racing oh seven oh seven. But you know, not they don't kill it, right? And then so yeah, we go up there. Guys will go up there and think, oh, I saw him down here. He wasn't mm. that good. In their backyard, in their backyard, they haul ass. <laughs> yes, they do. They really do. They're legit. So I don't know if people really realize that. And I found that you know, like I'll see guys come over here from different countries, and then I'll go race them in their country. Different. Just. Man, it's crazy what mentally it does because you're now you're in a foreign land. They're comfortable. They'll mm-hmm. kick your ass. You know, mm-hmm. weird. But um, so you guys had a good good time, had a good season, finished second. Yes, yeah, second. Yeah, yeah. And so then why didn't you, why didn't you guys go back again for a full season in fifteen? Yeah, Genova was of the mindset he wanted to do two in the motocross, two in the GPS, and two in America. Okay. So kind of like dabbling a little here a little there okay and that was 15 when i had a really bad crash at daytona okay and like i couldn't feel my legs for like 30 seconds that's that one you're talking about yeah okay. so i had to and they and they moved me which was weird at daytona they like picked me up and took me off the track and i, I shouldn't have done i that. don't agree with that no it shouldn't happen so um i was done for the rest of supercross um I I think I broke something in my lower back. I remember I I couldn't even move for like three four weeks. I wasn't bedridden or whatever. So yeah, then we start prepping for the GPS, and those were like May June, and we did the two over there. Oh, so you did do GPS? I did two of them. Which ones? Uh, it was uh, Madeley Basin and uh, France. I forget. Okay. The one in France. And uh, Saint, I remember Saint Dongeli, that one, or no, with the big hills, no, no. Okay. Um, if I th- I have, really have to think about it, and my results were terrible because I was just coming off of an injury from Daytona, uh, so I wasn't ready. And these guys are, you know, ha- almost they're in the groove, a quarter to half yeah. into the season, they're pinning it. So, you know, didn't what re- was that experience like though? Um, the experience was was fun being over in Europe. I mean, I had been in Europe a bunch of times. And, you know, like after the 05 season with, with, you know, the Tedesco incident, the next weekend was the Ireland uh, GP, and I won I won Saturday qualifying, and then the first moto on Sunday I was second, and I was doing looking at a podium for the second moto and uh, fell the first lap and was coming through the pack and, and then had another crash and didn't get on the podium. And my brother, <laughs> funny enough, got on the podium that moto. So, really? Yeah. Oh, and cool. uh, so I had experience, but going into that race in 15, I was hurt. Like yeah. I wasn't like strong yet and I was still trying to get up to speed. So it was just more like, you know, try to use them as like practice yeah. in a yeah. sense. And like I said, those guys were next level fast in you know, the quarter and middle part of their season. So no, I wasn't competitive. Then we came back. Then we started prepping for Canada. For were, were they cool to you over there? Like were they... Stoked oh, yeah. to see you guys oh, yeah. and helpful. And uh, me and Antonio are like really good friends, and to this day, like, 
like we would consider each other like brothers. Oh, wow. I lived cool. in Rome for about a month, month and a half in that 2010 season. So I came over there and did my pre- like some international races in March. Okay. February, March, whatever it was. So I lived in Rome with Antonio in that time period doing testing and riding and learning the bike before the 2010 out opener. Mm -hmm. That's why I was expressing like the prep was good for that 2010 season and riding with Antonio was good. Riding gnarly tracks, riding the sand, riding mud. It was awesome. Does he have cool places to ride around? Dude, you want to talk about good places? Like this. He's posted some Instagram stuff. I'm like, oh man, look at that dirt. Dude, some of the sand stuff they race or practice on, dude, I'm talking is taller than you and I combined and they're jumping across these, these, Big old breaking bumps and dunes like they're nothing. This is in Italy? This is in Italy, right really? on the coast in uh, Naples. Huh. So a couple hour drive from Rome. Wow. But just being in Rome was cool, like seeing the Spanish steps and oh, yeah. the Fountain of Trevi, like all the cool stuff that I, a lot of people will never in their lifetime ever see. Like my wife and I, like that's where we're so like grateful. We've been to Australia and Canada, Italy and England and in all these different yeah. places on somebody else's dime while yeah. getting paid to be there. And, and and we've done it all together since we were 15 years old, since we were kids. And I even have like the picture of us on the podium at Loretta's when I'm getting my last championship in 04. Like she's right there next to me. And it's like, we just look like young little kids. And yeah. now we're, you know, 19 years later together and married and two yeah. kids. I remember thinking when you were first, you know, coming onto the scene and you, you already had, you guys were already had, had, I'm thinking this kid's so young to have this girl. Like what? This is kind of strange. Yeah, I, I don't see you, this when, lasting. Yeah. Right? When you find the right one. Yeah. I mean, but you just know that's pretty rare when the people connect that young. Right. And it, yeah. and it lasts. Mm-hmm. So awesome that you guys have made it. I just, yeah. we've, and like I said, I cherish every moment we're together. And like I said, we've been so many awesome places in this world that most people will never, ever in their lifetime see mm. or or even think about traveling to go. I know. We're lucky. Um, okay, so the following season, what were you same program? So you were Supercross here? That was 16? 16. Yeah, 16. Um, yeah, it was uh, Supercross, Moto Concept. And, and, then, and then I was, and then I had a three year deal with Cowie in Canada. 16, 17, and 18. Oh, okay. So, I, yeah, this kind of kind of weird being on. And I think at that time, what, too. Did you guys switch to Hondas? Hondas, yeah. Because yeah, this is that original shirt. This is from the 2015 season. This okay. is the same same shirt I've had literally since 2015. If people are looking at it, it kind of yeah. looks a little worn, but whatever. You know, it's yeah. a shirt that Genova gave me, and I just I like it. It's comfortable. And <laughs> I've, I literally have not been given a new one since. So I'm like, I'm not the kind of guy who's going to just like take and give and, you know, just like ask, like, give me that. It's like, yeah. you know, if you want to give it to me? Cool. But if not, like, I'll just wear the same stuff, like whatever, <laughs> like it is I what like it, it is. But so that season went okay in Supercross, 12th overall. Um, <laughs> that was 16. Mm-hmm. And then, so you went to Canada and rode Cowies in the summer. Yes. What were the highlights from Supercross and then up there? Honestly, I don't remember Jack squat from 16. Yeah. Because that was during that time, 16, 17, where I was, I was mentally over it. Really? You were burned out? I was burned just, out, yeah. yeah. I think I had did my, like you said, the 10-year span, you know, call, look, looking from 05. Well, you yeah. Know. You started in 04. 04. And, really? And, and by 15, 16, I was burned out. So yeah. there was that, like you said, yeah. that 10-year. Yeah, it was a weird time, 16 and 17 and even 18 it was the results weren't there. I kind of wasn't. If you don't have the fire for no, it. No, no, no. You, you'll never compete at the highest level. No, no. Right? And I found this. It's interesting. Most people, they hit that window. They're, the kind of flame fades and they're just out. But then I've seen some guys like yourself where you give it a few years and all of a sudden you, you your perspective on it changes and you kind of appreciate the, how cool it is to still be able to do it. And if you're healthy enough and young enough. The way I look at it, so Kevin Wyndham. Perfect example, and this is kind of where I kind of base it off of. 2003, he came out the opener, came off a broken femur, and I think 01 or 02, he was done for like two years. Yeah. Vanished. Nobody heard from him. Comes out and just waxing Carmichael by like 20-second lead. He's gone. Yeah. This is the first moto of the year at Glen Helen. Everybody's just like blown away. Awesome that he's back. They're just, where did this come from? And then yeah. he goes over that weird jump, hits the tough block thing or that, that barrier, and he, Full endo. And then the second moto, he's 
you know, he rode good, but it was just one of those races where it just he came out of nowhere and yeah. it was like he was rejuvenated. Yeah. That's how I feel right now. I feel rejuvenated now that like Kevin got his life in order, he had his wife and kids, he started all that kind of stuff. Like kind of took a pause, a break. And now that I've been stepped away from Supercross for the last couple of years, it's like I'm motivated again. Mm. I want to come back and race Supercross and I see the guys that are racing and I see them and and I believe in my mind I'm as good or better than them. And that's where that belief system and that pause that it just, I needed to get away from it, rejuvenate. And now I'm motivated again. And yeah. that's, and that's where I feel like I'm ready to come back and to be at, at Supercross again. So did you do any Supercross in 20 or 21? Uh, no, no, no Supercross. Okay. I did a fill in for Vince in 19. That was it. Cause he did his ACL at Dallas like halfway through the Supercross, okay, and then, and then they called out. me immediately, and I was on a flight literally the next day to do some testing and uh, came back and, you know, had a couple of good finishes. I think Seattle, I was 12th, 11th or 12th, and that was my best Supercross finish that season. Uh, but no preparation. I mean, it was zero. Like, mm. I just, yeah. I mean, like, I'm watching on the Supercross every Saturday night, and then the next weekend I'm 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 in the race on TV. And I qualified for every single race that I was at, which was good. And my best finish, I think, was 11 or 12 at Seattle. And that was pretty much, I think Denver was my last last uh, super professional Supercross was in 19. Okay. Denver, yes. It was the day that it was snowing in practice. Yeah, I Which was that. freaky, super yeah. freaky. And then the nighttime. Those photos were wild, man. Dude. From the stands, it's just blizzard. <laughs> yeah. I remember. So we didn't pump up the brake, well, you know, warm the brake up. And from riding from the, the truck through the tunnel, to the practice on the first lap I went to hit the brake no brake I couldn't stop and I went fl- like off the track into the concrete fell because oh, the brake had like almost like froze up so we had to like warm them up properly for the heat race and everything like that but uh, that's crazy man that was that was a wild I mean the track was like muddy in practice and then from the polar opposite in the main event it was concrete like huh. like hard packed concrete yeah They've they've had so many they've tried in Denver so many times and it seems like it's either windy or it snows yeah or it's, it's it just doesn't work there plus you're at five thousand feet yeah I didn't I I qualified for the main like seven or eight and then I wasn't feeling good after the heat race and I was in the truck telling my dad I'm like hey I don't feel good like I'm, I'll feel sick like my stomach feels queasy something's not right I'm feeling like lightheaded so he has me get on the rowing machine just to like kind of warm up nope not good. And Thule is the AMA, you know, guy at the gate. He's like, hey, where's 800? Is he, you know, we're getting ready to load the gate. And he's like, hold on, he's still warming up. And I, I knew in my mind I wasn't right. And I made the call, and I'm like, nope, not racing. Don't feel right. Just just like a f- altitude. I, I, I get mm-hmm. weird altitude sickness at, mm-hmm. at that, that, that race, at mm-hmm. that area. I had the same thing happen to me this year in arena cross at the, mm-hmm. at the first mm-hmm. – uh, kicker arena cross this year. I got altitude sickness after the first night and the second night I didn't even, I rode the heat race, didn't race the main because yeah. I, I was not feeling it. That happens to a few guys. There's some guys Anderson, that struggle with it. Anderson. Anderson. He's the guy, he has to fly in literally the day of the race, race and then get the heck out of there. Huh. And it, I, it's weird because I, you know, grew up in the desert, three, 4,000 feet elevation. Yeah, it, it is weird. It, it doesn't, I mean, it's just, I don't know. It, it does. It doesn't affect me. When I'm when I'm down in like like Glen Helen area, I'm good. The sun is fine. It's just when I go up into the altitude, that's why I have to wear this long sleeve and be out of the sun because it's like my body like can't it can't handle that that sun and altitude. It's weird. That is weird. So yeah, it was a it was a weird deal. You know, not not racing the main event but qualifying. So it's kind of weird. Have you said motocross kind of comes more naturally to you? Yeah. Have you ever considered finding a ride over in the GPS? No. No, just don't want to live. Don't want to like. Pick I have. Up and my, go I, I mean, I would. I would. I mean, if it was a decade ago, I would have thought about it. But now that I've got wife and kids, yeah. and it's no way. Yeah, too hard, huh? I mean, you're talking about you know, all the way across the pond flying, which you know. Well, and really, to do it right, you got to live over. There. You're just gonna have to stay over there. Well, that's yeah. kind of like with the World Supercross. You can be flexible because they do the race, and then it's a couple week break, and then yeah. you race, and then a couple yeah. week break. Where like for me, I'm flexible. I can do that. I can I can go do it. Yeah. I can fly there, you know, do the interviews, do autographs, you know, 
go on the private yacht with the owners, like, you know, do whatever they need and you'll be a do part that? of it. You'll, you'll suck <laughs> it up and go ahead and do that? <laughs> I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's just, it, you can, I can be that guy that can be a part of it. Yeah. And for me, like the World Supercross, I want to get my foot in the door and be a part of it. Regardless of what team I'm on, I just want to be a part of it. So how, how much do you know about that? Like how, what can you tell me? Because the stuff I've heard, they've got a lot of money set mm -hmm. aside to fund this thing. They're okay losing money for up to five years. Mm -hmm. And they've got very big plans for this. The people behind it that run V8 Supercars in Australia are legit. Eric Pernard is involved. He's legit. Everything he's ever done has been successful. Bercy, uh, I think he started Geneva as well, but Enduro Cross, Minimoto Supercross, US Open. I Anything feel like, he touches is gold. Yeah, I feel like right now it's still in the beginning stages of like getting off the ground, but it's going to take off for sure. Mm. And I want to be one of the guys that is a part of it. Mm -hmm. And no matter which way that I got to be a part of it, whether it's on Moto Concepts or another team, mm. I'm available. I'm ready, willing, and able to go race. So is Hep Suzuki looking at that too? Yes. Mm -hmm. All the teams. I mean, most all the teams are. I mean, you got to be almost like foolish not to. I know. <sighs> Crazy. Um, as as one of the most successful amateur kids ever, um, what what advice would you tell somebody that's coming up um, who's either kind of in that amateur thing heavy right now or they're getting close to turning pro? I, I would say the age where you're like kind of going to make it or not would be like teenage years, 12, 13. I feel like those are the pivotal years – if you're going to make it or not, if yeah. you got it or not. I 12, mean, it, 12 to 15 probably, somewhere yeah. in that window. Yeah. yeah, right at the beginning stages of teenage years. I mean, it, you you can notice it, the kids' like dedication and work ethic, and if they got it or not. Yeah. And if they don't, man, just do it as a fun hobby. Keep it fun. Yeah. But there's a lot of kids, um, 15, 16, that are not even close. Mm. And they're still like, all in thinking they're going to make it. And I'm just going, dude, it's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. You know, you can tell if you're 15, 16 and you don't have, <laughs> you're not winning at least regionally. It's not going to happen. Yeah. Well, they got mom and dad though to fund it. And that's like the, you know, kind of what you see is like mom and dad give it the, the dream, you know, they fund it, they'd be a part of it. And then it's like, Hey, once you don't make it or it does, it's not looking like, here's your office, here's your desk. It's waiting for you when you're ready to be done. Yeah. And they got their job ready, already lined up. Any, any, anything you would warn people against or any cautionary tales, anything you would do different? Mm, that's a complex question, honestly. I mean, everybody would do something different. I just don't know if I would – I mean, you got to be tough on – like my dad was tough on us, like, in order to succeed, we had to eat, you know, to race. We had to race to win to eat and put food on the table. Like, that's what made Carmichael so good and Bubba so good and Villapoto so good. Like, we all, our families came from nothing, no money. And I'm not, like, t talking down the, the generation now. It's just they they have that backup plan already set, you know, where if they fail, they got their job ready and, yeah. The seats waiting for them at the desk and construction, whatever it may be. And, um, yeah, I, I just believe that hard work will always see the results through. I mm. mean, it, um, I was told years ago, I don't remember who it was, they said, I would take the more hardworking guy than the more talented guy any day of the week. Yeah. Meaning Carmichael over someone like that's more talented. Yeah. Per se. And at the end of the day, hard work will always. Yeah. And I think the guys who are making the decisions on these teams, whether it's Mitch or it's Roger or Ian or whoever, they'll, they feel that same exact way and they're paying attention. You know what I mean? Um, what about the transition? And that's and not kind of stopping you right there, but that's the hard thing too, about trying to get a ride right now for, you know, with anybody in a sense is that they have all these young 18 year old kids and yeah, I mean, I get it. I'm 34 years old, whatever, but I'm in my mind, I still, and I'm fit like strong and ready to go race at any time's notice. Like I can do it. And I'm 
going up against kids that are teenagers yeah. or 20 years old. Like you see Chiz, he just got that star ride. Like that's great for him. Same thing, 34 years old, 35 years old. Look at him, top 10. Like yeah. he's competitive. Yeah. He almost won the heat race over Jet yeah. at uh, Indy. I mean, it's. Yeah. Uh, if you're still healthy enough to do it and you're. It's just getting it's just getting the right team. Maybe right now what we're doing. Maybe this is maybe you know my show. It's weird. I almost feel like a like a teenager again, trying to prove myself to get the ride. Yeah. At 34 years old, like it's like I've already done the carousel, and it's like I'm ready to go back around <laughs> on the second go around and maybe just clean up the mistakes that I missed out. And I mean, you never know, man. I get the right opportunity and the things that I've learned. And the mistakes I've made, I can learn from and be like, dude, in outdoors, I could be, I mean, you never know, man. You put the work in and, yeah. you know, be consistent. You never know. Something could happen and find yourself possibly, you know, may, maybe. In the hunt. For in the hunt. In the know. hunt. What are the best and worst things you did in your transition to pro racing? So somebody who's making that jump from amateur to pro. What you know? What advice would you give them? Or would you say don't do this, but do this? Mm. Don't disrespect the. I mean, it's hard to say. Just I mean, don't disrespect the top guys. I mean, there's a reason why they're the top guys for a reason. I mean, you race them hard. Like that's where I kind of like. I raced McGrath in 2004, right after. Um, it was in Salinas, and I was. I just. I think I just turned 16. And um, we were battling, and I had to. He got the whole shot, and I had to pass him. And I remember slamming him to pass him, and I beat him. And I was so like excited. And I remember he flipped me off. He was pissed. He was mad. Oh yeah. And um, I was a huge fan. I mean, still am, obviously. I go up to him after the race. I'm like, hey, you know, great racing with you. Can I get your jersey? And he's first thing. He's like, man, you need to learn to respect your elders. You know, respect your elders. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, okay, okay, yeah. But can I still get your jersey? And he gave it to me. He did. He did. He signed it. And I just remember, like, at the moment, I was, like, so excited. I just beat the king of Supercross yeah. in, you know, a little. Was it that Grizzly Stadium Correct. Thing? Yeah, yeah, I was there CM, that night. There's a CM, CMA. CMA, yeah. There's yeah. Dustin Pipes and, and Aaron Pipes. They put on a great show, great first-class racing. So 03. This or was 04. 04. Okay, yeah. I had just turned 16. And, um, yeah, like I said, they run a great series, yeah. great show back then. And, uh, and I, I remember, you know, he was the, he was the man he, you know, he's paid to, you know, show up and race. And yeah. I'm just this little 16 year old kid is like, I just want to race McGrath. And, and yeah, that's uh, a tough line to walk, right? Because you, you're, you're, you're trying to win. Yeah. I, well, he's my idol. Well, it yeah. was worse too. Cause Danielle, my wife. Huge McGrath kid. Oh man, it was like it was like watching her idol and <laughs> and her you know boyfriend at the time. Like like who do you cheer for? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> who do you cheer for, and um, yeah, I I got the jersey and I had him sign it too to Dan to Danielle. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. So that's um, cool. That but like I said, around. that would be my advice: is man, respect your elders and. Well, you'll make it harder on yourself, right? If you come in and start slamming around into people yeah. they're gonna be like oh okay yeah and they're definitely more seasoned than you they're gonna know how to take you out and screw yeah. your life up better than you're gonna know it kind of like in a sense it like black balls you from like the yeah. beginning of your career and that i mean i've had success and results in racing in my career it's just been with obviously controversy at times and obviously being i feel in my personal opinion is being blackballed from a ver the very beginning like the very beginning in 04 because of the shirts, racing our, uh, uh, MC hard in that race and, you know, just not having the respect for the the GOAT, you know, mm -hmm. RC and and MC and his, you know, racing him that night and, and the Believe the Shirt, Believe the Hype shirts, you know, and, you know, just not respecting the the greats of the sport. And it just people took a, a offense to that for sure. And looking back on it now, like, do it all different. Like, mm. that's something that for sure I regret and would change and would advise the up-and-coming kids is respect your elders. Yeah. 100%. I like that. Um, tell me about your family now. You got, uh, you've got you got a daughter and then a fresh baby. Yep, two months old. Yeah, a little three-year-old and a two-month-old. And, yeah, it's been life-changing for sure. And we kind of 
decided, you know, at a, at a young age, um, we, I don't know if we should be saying this, but we had a scare at 16. So that kind of like, like threw us both through a loop. We're like, holy crap, they, my, our whole lives could be different right now. Mm. So we like vowed to each other, like we're going to wait till we're, you know, older and have kids and, you know, at least wait till we're pretty much done racing or close to done racing. And it was during that time too, I was burnt out in 16, 17. So it was, it just made sense. Yeah. And in 18, I didn't have any ride for the next year. So yeah, just God gave us a miracle and we got pregnant at 17 and had our first daughter in, in 18. And of course, you know, Christmas comes around and, you know, they're like, Hey, you know, we got that third year option still on the table you know and you still want it and i was like well yeah let's go i mean and at that time i mean it was during a weird time because my daughter our daughter was born right during the beginning of the season of canada so that kind of just i I like i wasn't focused i was doing everything i could to go to the race to get a result but not crash and get hurt and be stuck in canada in some foreign country where i can't be there for the birth of my daughter like that was on my mind and yeah. then, of course, and then, of course, we have our daughter, and then I'm like, I'm feeling good. I go to Ken Roxon's down at the nest, and I'm battling with him and Sexton doing practice starts and doing laps. And, and then uh, I had a weird little high side where I kind of scrubbed it and done, tore the labrum, done, mm. season over. And, yeah, um, so, like, kind of reiterating, it's like we just were smart after that when we were young, and we're like, hey, let's wait till we're older and wait till we're – pretty much done with racing or close to being done. Yeah. And that's what I kind of like was saying about my life is all in order. You know, my wife, kids, marriage, house, yeah. rental properties, like everything yeah. is like, yeah. I don't need to race to make money. I, I make the money from my rentals. Yeah. I'm good. Yeah. I race because my heart is, I still want to f- battle. I want to yeah. go scrap. I want to get into it. And, and, uh, are you, are your rentals in Florida? Yes, sir. Yeah. It's a good place to have them. Yep. Got four of them. Nice. Just residences? Houses and property. Yeah. Good for you, man. I, I love hearing when guys have done good things with their money because there's dudes that haven't. Yeah. They think, ah, this is, it's always, I'm always going to get $40,000 checks. We were advised, you know, Danielle and I, when we were, uh, I think it was the 07, 08 years, you know, when I was making good money. And, uh, you know, we were advised, hey, put your money in land and, and houses, stock, the, you know, things that are going to make you money yeah. every month. And, yeah, it was probably one of the best decisions. I yeah. wish we could have done more. I mean, you know, with the bonus money I was making with winning in that 09 season, we could have bought more houses. But, you know, when you don't have a ride for the next year, you you want to you save, save it. some. Yeah, yeah. And it was during the recession, so it's even worse. Because mm. you could have bought p- houses for pennies on the dollar when, in reality, like, you, we should have done it. But you were worried. But yeah, we were worried because there's no ride for the yeah. next year. Yeah. That, that was like, tough. and that was like our wedding too. Same thing in eleven. Um, the season was over, and we got married at the end of September. And I didn't have a ride, no offers, nothing. And I still put thirty thousand dollars down to get married in Catalina Island. And it was one of the most beautiful. I mean, it was a beautiful wedding, best day of my life for sure. It was yeah. getting married. Um, second, pro- probably second best to, you know, our daughter being born. Yeah. Like that was an awesome experience being a part of that. Yeah. And, you know, I'm just, uh, I'm just a family man now and just like, I'm, a, I'm still love training. I love racing. I love being a part of it and I still want to do it. That's the best yeah. part. Even at the age I'm at. What, um, what do you guys do for fun these days? You got a weekend well, off. What are you guys doing? Well, we live 30 minutes from the beach, so it's pretty easy. And my daughter loves the beach, mm. so it's pretty easy. You know, we just – we'll go – it's it's an easy drive. 30 minutes, you go to the beach, you're there all day. She falls asleep on the drive home. You're close to Jacksonville? Jackson- I live right on the state line, Georgia and Florida. Okay. So, yeah, Jacksonville is, is 35 minutes from my doorstep to the international airport, which is nothing, and a half-hour drive to the beach. Mm. Is there waves at that beach? Um, there can be, uh. but not very often. It's pretty, pretty calm and mellow. It's sharky too, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yeah. Yes. And, but w- the, the weird thing is like at our beach, we don't get that great breeze because you get the breeze from the Gulf going into the Atlantic. Hmm. So like Tampa, Orlando, they get a nice breeze. We don't get that. It's, it's like a stagnant, humid, <laughs> oh, yeah. hot heat. So, 
But that's what we like to do for fun is, is go to the beach. Go to the beach. And we, we live on the state line river one mile from the river. So we have jet skis. Now that, uh. And now that we have gr- little girls, we're, we're like scared to go take them because there's alligators in the, in the uh. river. So we're like scared to take them now until they're like bigger. So the jet skis are just kind of sitting idle right now for the last couple of years. Um, so the last question we always ask all our guests is how do you want to be remembered in this sport? I mean, I don't know. I mean, it, people are always going to have their opinion on me, whether good or bad. So it doesn't even matter I, yeah. I, whether I'm remembered or not. I just, I'm just a dude who loves my family and just wants to go race and race a dirt bike and, and provide for my family. And I still feel fit enough, strong enough and focused enough to be a part of it. And, you know, like I said, whether people like me or don't like me, it, it has no, you know, change on who I am. Yeah. It, the money I've made, the races I've won, the things that I've accomplished, they can't take those away from me. Yeah. So like I, I'm, I'm fine. I got a, I got a beautiful family, been with the same girl for almost two decades. You know, I got, I got my rentals. I got my house. I, I just, I just want to ride a dirt bike. That's all. That's all. Yeah. Well, and you, you and I were talking a little bit earlier about how you moving to Florida was kind of a way of escaping all the drama and chatter and whatever California life and you actually pulled up an old column of mine from yep. Mass Ping yep. um, which I thought I don't even re- I remember writing it but it was years and years ago well I can quote you well what you re- said. read it and tell me because you said it really resonated with you and you've screenshot it and kept yeah it. oh yeah I've kept it all these years you said somebody said to me a few months back that my championships come after my racing career was over. That did not sink in right away, but I am married to the perfect woman. I have three of the coolest jobs I could ever ask for, and my family has provided and the pride and, my pride and joy. I'm winning big time, just not in the way I expected. And I, I, that hit home to me because I feel like I've won more championships off the track than I ever could have imagined on the track. Yeah, so it's funny because my wife told me, obviously after that 2000 season, I... I was like a mess. It took me a long time to recover from that, you know. And she she always said, "Well, I'm your championship." Mm-hmm. And it's like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, I know, babe, but you know, damn it, let me I'm, you know, let me be miserable over here." <laughs> and it's like it took me some time to gain that perspective and and it's like as you get older, so I'm 47 now, right? So that was ages ago, but for years I would look back and I just think about it would, you know, drive me crazy and now I, I look back at it and I have totally different eyes it's like <laughs> where I'm at now the things I'm doing you know all of those experiences made me the person I am correct my wife my kids and my life now that's what matters not I've got this trophy on the wall or, or I've you know I got money in a bank account somewhere um, you start to see what really matters your pers- perspective changes and I feel like you've kind of I'm I'm so glad that resonated with you and it's and you've got your own thing now and you're in the same boat. You see what's important. Yes, sir. Right. So family is with you forever. I mean, racing is. Don't get me wrong. We all love racing. It's a, a a small part of your life. And by, I mean maybe not in today's world, but by 30 years old, you're pretty much done, retired, and you're on to the next thing. Yeah. And what do you do the next 50 years? Because you got a long time. You got a long time yeah. to live with the same person, and and you have to. I mean, you grow together as as a as a couple, and you know, whether it's good or bad, you you always kind of bend and and, yeah. and work together, and and um, yeah, like I said, racing is a small window of your life, and by thirty, it's over. And what do you do for the then next? What? Yeah. what do you do for the next sixty, seventy years? And well, and I know you like me are a product of a broken home, and so for me, having a successful marriage was a huge priority. Yeah. I did not want to go go through what I watched my parents go through. And so when you talk about things you're proud of, you know, your family, like my marriage is a huge priority for me as it should be for everybody. And it's, it's not easy all the time, but it's like having a successful relationship with your wife is huge, huge. And you guys have made it 19 years. Dude, that's awesome. So should be real proud of that. And then on top of that, I just want to say, as I went through all your results, I was blown away with all the podiums. I mean, I, I know you didn't get the championship it's, you wanted, but it's like, it's impressive, dude. I you, don't know who told me, but I was at Daytona just a couple weeks ago for the amateur thing. I raced on Sunday, Sunday, Monday. I raced Ryder Francisco, who is legit. He's fast. He's, <laughs> yeah. 
I, I, he, I have immense respect for him and how fast he is. He's going to be the future for sure. Somebody told me, hey, Mike, did you know that you're 43rd on the all-time win record in outdoors in the lights class and 38th all-time 450 class win record? Hmm. I was like, ah, that's pretty cool, man, to know like there's been that many winners in the history of racing professional motocross, and I'm on the all-time win list, you know, not first or second or like Carmichael, but I'm on the list for being, you know, one of the... Yeah, absolutely. You're, you know, it's like we, we've talked about priorities and where it sits, but if you're looking at your racing career, man, you have so much to be proud of. It's, it's very, very impressive what you've done. And I know your career, your name has kind of been synonymous with some drama over the course of it. Some of it earned, some of it not. Yeah. Uh, but that's all bullshit. You know what I mean? That none of that matters. And every time I've ever talked to you, you've been nothing but professional, nothing but nice and courteous to me, to fans. When I've watched you interact with people, I got a ton of respect for you, dude. So it's the things that people read, they 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 hear, see on the internet. That's the impression that I feel like people get, and it's the wrong one. Anybody yeah. that really knows me knows I'm a good dude. I just work hard, and I'm just want to provide for my family. That's yeah. it, straight up. Well, I respect the hell out of you. I appreciate you taking the time to come in, man. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you, guys. Stay tuned. We'll be right back to finish the show. I want to be bad with you, girl, like we're robbing a bank. I want to be mad at the world like it took you away. I want to be mad All right, folks, that's our show. Thanks so much for joining us. I want to give a big thank you to Michael Essie for taking the time to come in today. Um... You know, he's got a, a pretty impressive resume when you start looking down his list of results. Um, pretty pretty amazing what he was able to do. And, uh, you know, it's interesting because his career is kind of shrouded in a lot of drama uh, that it kind of involves more of his family than him. You know, Mike, Mike um, was definitely passionate and wanted to win, and he would do whatever it took, sometimes probably taking that a little too far. But, uh, man, you got to admire his tenacity and... Um, you know, to me, like I like I mentioned in the show, he's always been nothing but nice to anyone I've ever seen him interact with. And, you know, I, I'll take that over that other stuff any day. So big thank you to him and uh, big thanks to all of our partners and sponsors. Uh, please, if you guys are in the market for any of our partners' products, check them out first. Uh, these, are, these guys support us only if they can generate revenue uh, through their support of the show. So please give them a try. We want to keep bringing these shows to you. Uh, we appreciate it. Thanks so much for watching, and uh, we'll see you soon. The Whiskey Throttle Show is brought to you by Yamaha. Join the Blue Crew today and take advantage of all that Yamaha has to offer, including amateur racing trackside support, awesome Yamaha contingency, Jason Rain's demos and instructional classes, and frankly, the most high-performing motorcycles available in the market today. Whether you're looking for a four-stroke, a two-stroke, a side-by-side, -side, a quad, a boat, a generator, Yamaha prides themselves on absolute top-level quality and reliability. Rev your heart with Yamaha and join the Blue Crew today. Sore necks, aching legs, tight backs. Our bodies aren't designed to be constantly tense, but what can we do about it? Help your body relax with TheraBody. TheraBody creates effective, natural solutions to take charge of your daily wellness. By combining education, innovation, and over a decade of pioneering technology, TheraBody makes wellness more accessible for everybody. A traumatic motorcycle accident led TheraBody founder Dr. Jason Westland to create the Theragun for his debilitating pain. Now the Theragun, the only physician-created percussive therapy device, uses a scientifically calibrated combination of depth, speed, and power to relax and release your deep muscle tension. Recovery Air is TheraBody's world-leading pressure compression therapy system that flushes out leg soreness so you can bring on peak performance. Most electrical muscle stimulation is ineffective. Instead, TheraBody's sleek PowerDot takes away the guesswork with an intuitive app that customizes intensity and placement so you recover faster. Regular foam rollers hurt. TheraBody's Wave Series delivers powerful vibration and pressure to help you recover with less pain. Don't settle for mystery CBD. TheraBody's TheraOne range of topical and ingestible full-spectrum USDA certified organic CBD products are redefining high-potency CBD for wellness and recovery. 250 professional sports teams exclusively use Theragun and other Therabody products to take recovery into their own hands. 
Method Race Wheels, bringing you the lightest, strongest, fastest wheels in off-road for your truck, van, sprinter, UTV, or SUV. They've been dominating the Baja 500 and 1000 and every major off-road event around the world for years with high quality and performance. They also look amazing. They come in a bunch of different styles and colors for your rig, so check them out. You can get 20% off a set of wheels using our code Whiskey Throttle. No capitals, no spaces. 20% off using our code. Check them out. Also, coming soon, the R1M Project. Method Race Wheels makes a dive into the motocross world. Stay tuned. Troy Lee Designs is the leader in off-road motocross apparel and style. So whether you're looking for a cool new paint job for your helmet, maybe your name and number on your helmet lettered on, you're looking for new gear, you're looking for mountain bike gear, off-road gear, they've got the brand new Scout line in GP and SE models. Troy Lee Designs has it all. They've been leading this industry for decades, and they're going to continue to do it. Check out TroyLeeDesigns.com. SKDA is a moto graphics and seat covers company with several offices based around the globe. For too long, bikes and graphics have all looked the same. They just start to blend together. SKDA is working to change that. With super clean and unique design work, a bike with SKDA graphics stands out in a crowd and adds a touch of art to the world of moto. Hey, we need that. SKDA prides itself on providing premium customer service both before and after the sale is made. Visit SKDA online to view the current product range and get in touch with their team to get your bike refreshed. I want to just make a, a mention here that these guys, not only is their design way outside the box, very, very cool. They'll work with you on custom things. The, the products are incredible, okay? They'll speak for themselves. But what's really awesome, and you'll notice this the minute you order one of these, man, they give you an email saying, hey, the product's been shipped. Uh, hey, the product is here. It landed in this spot. Hey, it's coming today. Hey, your product's been delivered. They, they're just so good about staying in touch with you and letting you know where it's at. Customer service is 100%, and uh, that's just something that's rare these days. Check out SKDA. Here at the Whiskey Throttle Show, we're all about supporting brands that support our sport. And there's one tire company that has never walked away from the sport of motocross and supercross, and it's Dunlop. When times got tough and the economy took a crash, Dunlop stepped up and stayed with our sport to support it and the athletes and individuals that love it. Their MX-53 line and MX-33 lines absolutely dominate this sport. Every national championship at the pro level has been won in the last decade, and nearly every single amateur national championship at Loretta Lynn's has been won on a Dunlop. So if you're looking for high performance, you're looking for amazing quality, and you're looking to support a brand that never turns its back on our sport, there's only one choice for you, and it's Dunlop. Pro Circuit is the leader in aftermarket performance and quality. Whether you're looking for a little more horsepower out of your engine, some quality hard parts to improve the way your bike feels and looks, better handling through suspension or linkage or linkage arms, Pro Circuit is where you need to stop. It's your one-stop shop. You can go in there and get everything you need to make your motorcycle go from average to exceptional. Pro Circuit's got enough number one plates on their wall to side an entire home. And there's a reason for that. They're very, very good at what they do. Uh, the highest quality products with one goal in mind, and that's winning. Check out ProCircuit.com. Nihilo Concepts is leading the way in aftermarket hard parts. With their secondary on-switch device, something that was much needed in this sport, they've been innovating and bringing new products to market. Their latest is the new Nihilo Run Cool Brake Pistons. They're designed to be stronger than stock and provide exceptional cooling performance with less brake drag. Most OEM calipers pistons are made from aluminum that just can't hold it to the heat and extreme demands of serious racing. When they get hot, the aluminum will distort, causing loss of hydraulic pressure and brake failure. Nihilo's run-cool pistons limit the area that boiling hot hydraulic fluid is able to come in contact with the piston, leaving two-thirds of the piston volume in open air with breather holes to enhance the cooling ability. It's made of a proprietary stainless blend which is better at dissipating heat. You have issues with brake fade or brake failure, check out Nihilo Concepts among their many amazing hard parts and carbon fiber parts and titanium. Nihiloconcepts.com. Senna is the leader in motorcycle helmet communications. There's really two prongs to why this is important. One of them is safety. If you're a dad who's watching your kid out on a track, being able to communicate with him about a rider down or a track situation is imperative. You don't want him coming over a jump and seeing a rider down and getting himself involved in that. So from a safety aspect, it's huge. You can also coach them. So if you see them taking a line, doing something that they could be improved, it's very easy to just click a button and speak to them right in their helmet in real time. This has been a proven coaching technique used by many motorcycle coaches. 
There's also just the simple fun factor. Being able to chat with your buddy while you're out on a ride, share music between one another, answer phone calls, it just takes your riding experience to another level. So whether you're using the 50S or 50R connected through a mesh network in your helmet, or you're using a Tough Talk headset connected with one of those, Senna is the leader in quality and performance in motorcycle helmet communications. Check them out at Senna.com. Seat Concepts is the leader in motorcycle saddles. If you're looking for a new cover or a new seat entirely, Seat Concepts is the place to go. They make custom seat foams catered to your height, weight, riding ability, riding type. They also have waterproof covers and, and foams that will not break down if you ride in a lot of inclement weather. And they pride themselves on being much more comfortable than OEM or any other aftermarket company. If you're looking for a new seat or a new cover, Seat Concepts, there's nothing better. Need to replace something on your bike that's worn out? Look no further than Pro-X. These guys aim to make everything OEM quality or better at an affordable price. And they've also got some new products coming. So right now, chains, sprockets, anything inside the, in the engine internally, air filters. If it wears out, Pro-X makes it, and they make it at a quality level that's OEM or better. And they've got some new things coming that are awesome. A complete engine rebuild kits for the Polaris RZR 800s, Need to replace something on your bike that's worn out? Look no further than Pro-X. These guys aim to make everything OEM quality or better at an affordable price. And they've also got some new products coming. So right now, chains, sprockets, anything inside the, in the engine internally, air filters. If it wears out, Pro-X makes it, and they make it at a quality level that's OEM or better. And they've got some new things coming that are awesome. A complete engine rebuild kits for the if you've got a little Grom that's looking to get started in the motorcycle world, the best way to get them going is on a Stasic bike. They've got multiple sizes, so from your very young Groms to those who are a little more grown up, you can start them safely. They've got controls that allow you to control the speed so he can't get going too quick. They can touch the ground. There's not a lot of noise to distract them. It's the perfect way to get your child involved in motorcycling at a very young age. And if you've got a kid who's already out ripping, there's series popping up all over. For those of you in Southern California, go to www.ameminicross.com and join their local series. If you're outside of this state, contact your local track and ask them about starting a Stasic class at your local track. Get over to Stasic.com and check out all they've got going on. Motul USA, uh, we, we lean hard on these lubricants to keep us uh, on the track and on the trail. And Motul has proven their quality over and over, uh, most recently with their Dakar win with Ricky Brabeck. Uh, they're sponsoring Supercross teams. They're diving into our sport again full full throttle, and uh, we're stoked to have them on board. Amazing products, top to bottom. Motul USA, go check them out. OGO is the leader in motorcycle storage solutions. As motocross riders, we need a gear bag, we need a helmet bag, a boot bag, a backpack, a travel bag, a hydration pack, maybe a toolkit to wear around your waist if you're on an off-road ride. OGO makes all of that, and their products are absolutely top of the line. I've got stuff I've had for several decades, just to give you an idea of how long this stuff lasts. If you're not sure, ask around, talk to folks who've had some of this stuff, and they will confirm that OGO's quality is absolutely second to none. So go check them out, OGO underscore powersports.com, and look at all they've got to offer right now. You ever heard the phrase that the harder you work, the luckier you are? Well, at Luck Apparel, they believe in an acronym that kind of sums it up a little more simply than that, laboring under complete knowledge. So it isn't just some random chance that determines what your outcome or results are going to be. It's being educated and working your butt off to get it done. And I think that that goes hand in hand with the motocross industry. You don't get lucky into a win. You work your ass off and you make it happen. So check out Luck Apparel. They've got t-shirts, hats, sweatshirts, all kinds of cool stuff. And we're stoked to have them on board here at the Whiskey Throttle Show in 2022. If you're in the market for a toy hauler trailer, car trailer, cargo trailer, look no further than Custom Outfitters, one of our new partners for this year. Uh, these guys do an awesome job, even so far as to dial in the inside of Sprinter vans, which have become the new standard mode of transportation for moto. Uh, these guys can handle it all. Uh, they use ATC world-class trailers, uh, top shelf service, and performance in their products. Uh, Custom Outfitters out of South Dakota doing an awesome job. We're stoked to have these guys on board this year. So whether you're looking to just do some camping with the family, uh, looking for a trailer that can fit all your toys to go out to the desert or wherever, uh, look no further than Custom Outfitters.
And finally, last but not least, specialized bicycles. If you are in the market to start pedaling, this is where you want to start. Uh, they've got great entry-level bikes all the way up to the Cadillac, the new Levo um, e-bike. Uh, any, anything in between, man. It doesn't matter what kind of riding you're doing. Go check out and start with Specialized. Don't waste your time on something that's going to break. The derailleur's not going to shift after a couple months. Get something quality. Uh, these guys make it. Specialized leads that industry. Hey, guys. Welcome to another MPH video, Moto E Performance and Health. Uh, I'm your host, David Pinger, here with Rob Beams. Thanks for having and, me. And uh, the coach and I are going to go over something today that affects all of us. We spend a third of our life doing this, hopefully, and sleeping. Uh, how do we improve our sleep? And I'm just going to tee that up and let you go. You know, it's uh, it's something that everybody search, searches for, especially when we're already cutting it down to six and a half, seven hours, and we're like, hey, how do I get all the, the fringe benefits of it? You know, it's, it's actually quite simple. It just requires a little bit of documentation. Uh, first and foremost, our brains are pretty curious. You know, we're always looking to engage. So first thing you've got to do is get all the noise out of the room. Mm. And, it, and it's sometimes it's subtle. You know, you'll have someone in the other room. You hear the TV, the radio. And our brains, it doesn't have the ability to go, okay, we're going to go to sleep now, so we'll turn off any audible engagement. It hears something. It says, hey, let's, let's converse with this. At, at the very least, let's be snoopy and listen. Yeah. And so the idea is you got to get that noise out of there. Some of us um, have had some luck with earplugs, uh, maybe turning on a fan and having a little bit of white noise. There's those apps on your phone now that can give you that, that background noise. So that would be the first thing you'd want to take a look at. The other thing is light. A lot of people underestimate the power of our phone being on a nightstand. You keep getting notified. You may even have it on silent, but, you know, if, it, if a reminder on your calendar mm -hmm. pops up or something, it, I don't know. All Just the, a little buzz. That's, that's all it is. To but that out. light. In the middle of the night, you know, there's pitch black and that white light comes on. Even if you have it turned upside down, it's amazing how your brain will catch that. So you got to make the room dark. If you've got to use blackout sheets, um, that I would recommend doing that as well. The other thing is that the room's got to be extremely dark and cold. So, you know, think about a hibernating bear. I'm not saying make it 42 degrees, but, you know, the colder the better. And then layer up on the blankets. The body loves that hibernation side of things. Uh, the, the sensitive subject that people like to talk around is going to bed sexually satisfied. Um, it's a hormonal release. It's, it just, if you look at all the endorphins that come with it, it's a win-win and then satisfying appetite. You know, if you go back to the hierarchy of needs and, and I've had some pretty good adult conversations with people who don't want to get into the keyboard bashing, but really want to engage because there are some concerns that eating before bed is going to get an insulin spike and all of this. And I go back to the body, if you're going to force it to make an executive decision between going to sleep hungry and or sleeping, it's going to give up the sleep to go back and eat. And if you look at the idea, look at how powerful your naps are after you've had a good meal. I'm not saying that the, the turkey day Thanksgiving induced coma that we put ourselves in with so many carbs, but I'm just saying when you satisfy appetite, that can only be done with two macronutrients, protein and fat. So eating something like an avocado with extra virgin olive oil. Um, that may, be seen, may seem a little too heavy for some people. Um, I was on a TV broadcast where, you know, I'm a big fan of ice cream before bed. You know, going with a high-quality ice cream, I know it's got some sugar in it, but there's a higher percentage of carbs, excuse me, protein and fat if you're going with a high-quality ice cream. So if you want to satisfy your hunger with an avocado and extra virgin olive oil, go for it. I'm going to go with a haagen <laughs> bar. Um, I'm a Tillamook guy, but there whatever, I'll, yeah. I'll hang in there with you. The quality is there nonetheless. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that goes back to trying to find what works for you as an individual. I just, if you can really sink your teeth into the idea of satisfying appetite with protein and fat, that's always going to be your starting point right off the bat. And then it just cascades from there. And this is why I was saying it's so important that you look at what document. If you go to bed at relatively the same time, your body loves consistency. Mm -hmm. Think about when your daughters were young. You didn't have a sporadic go yeah. to bedtime. You had a routine. When did that change? I say that quite often on podcasts. And you know, we rush into this adulthood thing. We want all these responsibilities and independence. And what would you give to go back to when M&Ms were more valuable than oh, money? You yeah. know what I mean? And that's where we hurt ourselves as, as human beings because what are the two things that we screw up the most as we become adults? We eat less and we sleep. We don't sleep enough. Yeah. And the sleep that we get is not enough quality. It's not enough quantity. So we gain weight. We're going to talk about that in another show. But the idea here is when you understand truly physiology, going to bed hungry is not going to improve your quality of sleep. 
when you don't get the quality sleep, you don't release the hormones that makes you naturally leaner. You don't get the deep sleep, which releases testosterone, which increases red blood cell count. You'll have more energy because you have more oxygen. Mm -hmm. Who would think sleep could have such a positive effect? Do you, do you recommend cutting off water at a certain point? Because I know for me, especially as I've gotten older, yeah. I have to get up and pee at, you know, absolutely. If I'm hydrating, right. Yep. That's um, where you got to document because, you know, you could drink 20 ounces at seven thirty and it works great. Seven forty five and you're up twice. Yeah. You know, it's um, definitely plays a big role in it. Um, but if you go back and you understand that to, to find out how much water to take in just from a health standpoint, take your body weight, divide it by two, spread that out over eight to 10 hours, your normal work day. Then finding out when you should cut that off, you know. Yeah, that's another important yeah. part, right? Well, some people will hear us talk about it on the show, and they'll be like, "Oh, well, it's four o'clock in the afternoon, and I'm a hundred ounces behind." Yeah, and not a good idea, because now you're going to ruin yeah. your sleep for that night. Yeah, just recognize that you're behind a little bit. You'll probably notice it on the scale, but just try to be a little bit more cognizant of it tomorrow. And I'll say this, you know, I, I'm um, I'm somebody that doesn't. I, I definitely like to have a good deal on something, mm -hmm. but a bed, right? This is. Um, this is like the equivalent of getting cheap on a helmet. That's right. I mean, this is the one that you spend a third of your life there. Supposed and, to. And the way that those eight hours or nine hours go for you depends right. on how you feel for the other, <laughs> the other hours. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Man, don't, don't get cheap. Find the right bed. And, well, and, and for the listeners that have the privilege of going to the track and, and going riding in a motorhome, the bed needs to be exactly in your motorhome of what you've got at home. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we even ask our clients to have the exact same pillow, the exact same blanket, the exact same fan, try to get the exact same temperature. Because you, the more consistency that you can create, mm. the better your sleep's going to be. Sure. And think about it. As you said in a previous show, how much time and energy do we spend making the money to go racing to only undermine it with a bad bed, Yeah, a cheap bed? Yeah, it's crazy. So it, it, it's, it, it can't be overstated how important sleep is. Yeah. So listen to the things that, that Rob's saying here. There's, there's more resources over at CompleteRacingSolutions.com. Go check those out. Get your butts to bed. Get some good sleep. Uh, and uh, we'll see you guys here for more MPH videos soon. One Just Thanks for watching the Whiskey Throttle Show, now available on the Spot Network, an independent standalone streaming platform live now on Apple TV, Roku, Amazon Fire, Google Play, Android TV, most smart TVs, and all phones and tablets. Look for future live shows and specials only available on Spot Network. Download the app today on your favorite device. And don't forget to like and subscribe and click the bell to get alerts for all the latest content. Follow us on Twitter at W underscore throttle underscore show and on TikTok, Facebook, and Instagram at Whiskey Throttle Show.